Hello, 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 everyone, to History of Today. It's rather belated. The last time we had the series, the first episode of the series, was Semi Agog and myself discussing gender alchemy, a history of trans. Um, as for a general sort of overarching structure of history of today, for those who aren't aware of it, this is history in light of modernity. This is more relaxed, it's more generalized, and it's focusing on prevalent themes and ideas throughout the grand sort of arc of history. Uh, as far as current events go, it seems prescient that this stream is taking place just before Remembrance Day uh, for reasons that really should become obvious. Uh, I want to first introduce my co-host for this series, Samir Gog. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Happy that we can uh, continue this series and very happy to have uh, AA as a guest, he's bringing some real star power. I think just before I, I go on to our to our special guest, uh, is there anything you want to bring up regarding your own channel or what you do for people who aren't aware? Uh, thank you. Yes, I have a channel on YouTube. Uh, you can also find it on uh, BitChute, God help you, and uh, on on Odyssey. It's called Semi Agog. There's also a sister channel with some old clips called A Safer Space. So please check out Semi Agog uh, here on YouTube and feel free to follow me on Twitter, Telegram, uh, Odyssey, and on these other platforms. Thanks. Uh, fantastic. And obviously, Semi Agog has been a semi regular guest on this channel. So there are also videos uh, you can watch with him. Uh, but we're very lucky to be joined by Academic Agent. Hello, sir. How are you doing, uh, AM? Pleased to, pleased to be here. Uh, and as with Semi Agog, would you like to introduce yourself? Because it's the first time appearing on this channel. Is it really? Okay. Uh, well, um, I uh, run a channel called Academic Agent. Um, uh, you can get courses at a site of mine called the Academic Agency, uh, where I sell uh, various uh, things that will help you uh, gain useful skills. The, the Trivium is probably the best selling course there. Um, you know, I have a Substack and various other things. But uh, yeah, if, you've, if you're if you not subscribed to my uh, YouTube channel, then uh, do uh, check it out. Uh, although I, I'd be interested to know how many, like, because uh, I remember that you, AM, first came on my show, Unpopular Opinions, when we were discussing uh, the Byzantine Empire. Do you remember that with Sargon? Uh, and I'm pretty sure that was your debut on my channel. So your, yours has grown quite considerably since then. So I'm pleased to see you doing so well. Well, thank you so much, A. And it was actually my first debut on YouTube, full stop. So I have much to credit you for that. And funny enough, as for reasons that may be oddly apparent, there'll be a strange overlap, I think, in terms of the things we brought up there and uh, the things we can possibly bring up today. Uh, but a final point I want to bring up is that both you and Semi Agog have been having uh, a bit of a back and forth regarding the legacy of the British Empire uh, for several months if not years now so it's wonderful to get both of you on to discuss this and really hash out possibly even some sort of conclusion for this topic in light of uh, the spheres we occupy uh, so just for a very quick introduction albeit in terms of my audience you really should all be aware the british empire a indomitable maritime empire that would go on to encompass a quarter of the world's land surface, a superpower in the 19th century, a great power in the first half of the 20th century. And as of the 21st century, we need to question whether the remnants, the United Kingdom and its former dominions, even possess sovereignty. Um, if people want to find out more in terms of a a brief overview, and I, I put brief in quotes regarding the British Empire. I do have a hour long series of reflections, which is linked in the description, which you can find at the bottom of this video. In terms of how I wanted to structure this stream, there are three things I really wanted to get at, which is what is the British Empire? What is its essence, essentially? Uh, what is essential, what is ultimately its legacy? And another point, which follows on from legacy, uh, what is its culpability in terms of creating the situation we have today and being the author of its own doom? Um, 
I, I think a brilliant way of, well, I underestimate, overestimate perhaps with the word brilliant, <laughs> uh, is to reverse engineer this. So we start off with the collapse of the empire. And from there, we try and explore an understanding as to whether um, the collapse was inevitable. Uh, was this due to ideology or was there some sort of uh, dramatic shift that occurred which enabled this situation where the British Empire uh, suffered an almost inexplicable death in the context of the position it occupied in the 19th century to being basically irrelevant in the 21st century? Uh, and essentially, or was it a hapless victim in this entire situation? And by extension, I even want to speculate as to whether the British Empire even existed as a fully sovereign force, and to whether both the British Empire and the US empires were representative of something beyond themselves, representative of some greater force. And I know uh, Semiagog may have a lot to say on this topic. Uh, so the first thing I want to do very briefly is Semiagog, you first. Uh, any sort of general ideas on why the British Empire collapsed? Yes, well, first, I should say that in everything that follows, um, first off, the disagreement between uh, AA and myself on this is a friendly one. Um, underline that, and it is between uh, gentlemen. Um, the second point is that when I talk about what the British did or what the Americans did, I'm referring specifically to uh, elites in both countries uh, and to some extent their uh, dupes and uh, cat paws, cat's paws. So, um, you know, with everything that I say, I'm not, this is, should not be understood as reflecting upon uh, the people uh, of uh, both nations, of uh, either nation, uh, insofar as I subscribe to uh, uh, elite theory, as uh, set forth certainly by uh, AA himself. Uh, I believe, in short, my idea of what's been happening is that there was a great uh, mercantile empire. Uh, which was basically uh, made up um, by Britain's various uh, commercial enterprises, like uh, the the British East India Company, with which, if I remember correctly, was one of the first corporations, if not the first corporation in Britain, uh, which kind of gave us that mechanism as a kind of dead hand of the past that it would extend extend across time uh, and have different. Um, you know, to becoming an en entity um, through which um, commercial and other sorts of power uh, could be um, wielded. Uh, so my, my view is that these various companies and their commercial interests formed a kind of commercial empire. And eventually it became clear to the people who ran these companies that it made much more sense to drop, uh, to, to shovel off the cost of maintaining uh, security and uh, logistics to some extent onto the um, taxpayers uh, in Britain, uh, at which point it became a quote unquote empire, but that it was always uh, a commercial one favoring the operations of uh, various forms of oligarchy uh, behind the scenes. And because it was quote unquote private to some extent, um, uh, or, it, or it was certainly more private than things that were explicitly um, government entities. It gave them a leeway to do all sorts of things that they couldn't otherwise do. And that this state of affairs continued uh, supported by um, British experience with groups like the Parsis, uh, like uh, the Ismailis, uh, the Jews, uh, and the Armenians. Um, the, the British experience with all these groups having shown them how minority groups could wield enormous power outside of conventional political and military arrangements, um, supported also by a very competent uh, intelligence service, um, perhaps one of the world's most competent, going back to uh, Walsingham. Uh, it, it continued for quite some time. And uh, then there was the business of the United States um, uh, coming into existence as a result of a revolution or rebellion, what have you, um, at which point uh, the United States became uh, a potential uh, tool as well as a potential competitor, which would then bring us to uh, the war between the states and the United States uh, and the or what others called the Civil War and uh, and the subsequent dominance of the Yankee, a specific type 
of uh, Northeastern uh, American with very, very close connections uh, to um, Great Britain. Uh, and that would bring us to the question of what happened with World War I and World War II. Uh, I believe we'll get into that later. I was told this should be very brief, so I, I apologize for having rambled quite so long. No, it's it's a thoroughgoing exploration, and it gives us a lot to chew on regarding the uh, uh, the future of this conversation. So, academic agent, I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, well, I mean, I I tend to, uh, I mean, in so much as the debate between myself and Semyagog, I think the real question is the degree of the degree to which America is a continuation of the British Empire versus its, its its own entity, right? What we call the global American Empire now, that comes with a set of social attitudes, LGBT rights, civil rights, respect for the coloured peoples of the world, and so on and so forth. To what extent is that a continuation of what the British Empire was, uh, or was turning into? And to what is uh, to what extent is that? the uh, actually the antonym or the antithesis of what the British Empire was because I, I do think that there's an extent to which what people call woke now woke everybody's familiar with the progressive stack yeah uh, where you know straight white men are down at the bottom and you know something like a kind of disabled black lesbian let's say is somewhere at the top of the progressive stack right um and I think there is a, a way in which you can see woke as a total inversion of what the hierarchy in the British Empire was in the middle of the 19th century, for example. Okay, where, I mean, even our categories of race, I don't want to sound too much like a kind of left-wing academic here, but even our, the categories of race that we think about in some respects were constructs, quote-unquote, of the British Empire in, in so much as they existed as legal or political categories okay and i really think that the what people call races okay, quote, is a um is you know a legacy of the british empire in so much as it it had a hierarchy which, which was pretty obviously in the service of um itself and its own people and the people who ran it who were you know let's face it white men in the main um and what i think has happened in let's say the hundred years between 1850 well let, let's say the era between 1850 and now how long is that uh it's more than 100 years uh, uh quick maths people it's more like 173 like years yeah like say 170 year period um what has happened is that that old hierarchical system has been completely inverted turned upside down um and some of the legal prohibitions that existed not so much in britain itself in england itself but in in the actual colonies um have also been inverted and strangely inverted here uh and 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 in america and i um i partly see that as a consequence of what I would broadly describe as the ideology of Americanism writ large, which is, in my view, anti-European, anti-traditional, and has constitutionally been so pretty much since its inception. Um, now, <laughs> there are some nuances there, right? Because I will grant at the outset here that some of the social forces that gave rise to the worldview that we call woke today actually do have their start in the late British Empire uh, and I'm talking about the British Empire between about 1870 and um, pretty much the pretty much Suez you know that that if you take that chunk of time um, you can actually see let what we would call today left-wing social attitudes forming within the British Empire um, but the how can I put it? Even even during the era of Churchill, for example, it was still recognizably imperial. Um, and 
my view of the American empire is that it is not actually an empire in the strictest sense. It is a, it is a kind of new beast that um, almost uniquely uh, is is run <laughs> not for the benefit of its own. Like there are basically like almost no perks to being an American living in America under the American empire. Whereas I do think that there were there were tangible benefits uh, for British people living under the British Empire, um, even if elites got the larger share of the pie, I think that you know you could uh, I don't know a middle class guy for example could uh, be a colonial administrator somewhere in Africa and he'd have an amazing standard of life comparatively because it was being run for his benefit. Um, but I see none of that in the American Empire. If anything, the American Empire is run for the benefit of out groups of various kinds. Um, so that that is where I would distraw, draw the distinction. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Well, no, thank you, Semiagog and AA for both of these. I mean, both of these um, views, if I were to generalize them, uh, contrast and, well, I wouldn't even say contrast. I would say they, um, uh, they add necessary context to the idea in terms of the relevance to today and they, give us several avenues of exploration. In terms of my overview, I'm going to be very brief, uh, which is probably controversial for people listening in that I don't believe the British Empire existed at all. If it did exist, it was a series of empires, both in succession and existing at the same time, uh, rather anachronistically. And I do believe that the United States becoming independent uh, was not only an existential threat to the coalescing of the British Empire into a real empire, um, but it represented a fundamental failure of institutions. It represented a failure of the crown, it represented a failure of parliament, and it even represented a failure of the, Eng of the English Reformation. So I see, especially post the American Revolution, as the British Empire going through a series a succession of events where it could have coalesced into an empire proper. Instead, it never did. And ultimately, the progression of the history of the British Empire is, as Semigog is actually interested in this topic regarding centralizing forces and decentralizing forces, it's fundamentally centrifugal. It starts off in the hands of a very small clique. And then the group of elites that you've described, uh, described AA expands further and further and further into the point that there is no tangible connection to the homeland. There is no ideology of empire. There is no collective interest. And ultimately, as we see, even with someone in the late Churchillian period, uh, there was no one, there was no pilot at the ship. The, the wheel of the ship is basically running out of course and there is no future for the empire because there is no one leading it and there is no one who can envisage a future projection for it. And to con contrast this with the United States, Britain began as, or the British empire, if we are to look at it in terms of broad categories and bearing in mind this idea that I believe the British empire in terms of a genuine empire never existed. The concept of being English and British begins with the idea of being a subject, a subject to the crown. America begins as an alliance of sovereign entities. There is not an American nation in the modern sense. Rather, people think of themselves as Virginian. People think of themselves as New Yorkers from Maryland or Maine or broad categories of New England or whatever. And so when Semiagog brings up the concept of Yankee, I believe this represents something that the British Empire fundamentally failed to do in terms of coalescing into an empire proper, in that America became a nation, and worse for the British Empire, America went from being a collection of essentially Anglophone ethnostates uh, into becoming a propositional nation. And the turning point, as far as I'm concerned, from a disparate collection of colonies, which are in many ways representative of the Whig legacy of the British Empire, is the Gettysburg Address. The idea of the Constitution as th the defining raison d'etre of the United States, and that we should fundamentally redefine the relationship between the federal government 
slaves and what it really means to be an American, as A is expounded upon the point that this process becomes so inverted to the point that being an American is no longer tangible. And it seems that this process of inversion then crosses over into the British Empire and we have merit many Americanisms. And you can say the most obvious example of this is the transition, as I began at the beginning with the idea of a British subject being the unifying force behind any sort of English recognition as an ethnicity, the progression from subject to citizen embodying a US conception of the term essentially as belonging uh, to something which is more Republican in its form of government. And I do mean Republican in the very literal sense of representing res publica. It is a public thing. It is a collective thing. Power is devolved among various individuals to the point that any notion of subject to nation or subject to an individual becomes a complete farce. Uh, so I would like to progress from that, those various points that I've made, and uh, either semiagogue or AA, is there anything you would contest about that view? Well, uh, there, uh, well, I, would it be fair for me to uh, quickly respond to the points uh, that uh, AA raised as well as the oh, ones oh, yes. Oh, oh yes, this should be a, a general sort of discussion as in, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, talk, Contrast us your position with both of us. Yes, absolutely. Okay, fair enough. the 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 first um, the the first point to raise is that you know you pointed out, and I think it's quite right that the British Empire uh, was not or was only partially uh, and for brief periods uh, an empire um, in any fundamental sense of having um, a sovereign at the center and um, and some. Uh, explicitly ruling over all the dominions as opposed to, be, for example, being Empress of India, uh, points you raised in, I believe, the second to last uh, video you did. I recommend both your last two videos, as indeed all of your videos, um, but I recommend those last two for people who are interested in this subject. Um, and, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that the U.S. empire, um, by the same token, isn't really an empire, and AA sort of touched on that. That uh, in in both cases we see um, indirect control and manipulation, particularly through things like color revolutions and uh, intelligence services, and the use of minority groups in order to drive uh, um, wedges. If it's okay, Semiagog, I, ju I just want to add a point of clarification in terms of how we're defining empire, and it's possible to define it by I, I think three categories. There is subjugation to, say, for example, an individual or group of individuals as representing imperium in the Roman sense as representing command. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be tied to any particular nation, which comes into the second point, which is that a notion of empire almost presupposes that there is a dominant group or there is a dominant ethnicity. Say, for example, in the Mongol Empire, it was very much an aristocratic empire which was ruled over by a small and ever dwindling set of elites who had ultimately come to be assimilated by the cultures they conquered. I would also by that same token describe Islam as representing an imperial force as an aristocratic force um, with imperium not only expressed through uh, the Arabs but also expressed through the prevailing ideology of Islam. So an ideological component is also necessary to the British Empire. And in terms of looking at various precedents for British rule, which they integrate into their various empires, uh, one needs to look, say, for example, at the Indian Empire. On the one hand, Semiagog, you've talked about the commercial penetration into India, but the India that existed before assimilated many disparate religions, uh, Jains, Hindus, Sikhs, and even Parsis into a superstructure known as the Mughal Empire, uh, which in turn at one point tried to assimilate all of these ideas, including Islam, of course, which is the dominant religion, into a form of imperial secreticism, i.e. combining all of these religions together into one religion, to create one empire. So, sorry, I just wanted to add that point of clarification because I, I didn't want us to to go into this conversation having not defined our terms, and that's a, a fault on my part. But please, Semigol, continue. Uh, 
Yes, indeed, that was the case in India. I had people like Akbar, you know, having famous miniatures painted with people who were Hindu with their little katars on their belts, you know, their punch daggers, uh, and the Muslims standing beside them with uh, with their tulwars. Yes. Um, so, so basically, I'm just saying that insofar as we can um, discuss in what sense uh, the British Empire was or was not an empire, many of those same questions about indirect rule, protectorates, control of elites, intelligence services, color revolutions, and the rest, they, they apply just as well uh, to both of our uh, respective uh, um, imperial structures, uh, in quotes. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's one thing uh, I wanted to point out about what you said, and the other is that uh, indeed the U.S. was recognized as a threat uh, by the British um, and and a, a, a potentially a, a serious competitor. Uh, I would say from from the first, you know, they they moved on the United States in uh, 1812. Um, or in that period, there's a there's a great video with uh, Bagby that uh, AA hosted on his channel. And uh, I believe that uh, continuously um, uh, from the, 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 the independence of the United States, the Brits were aware of it as a threat and were actively um, subverting it um, when uh, the, the force of arms uh, proved um, inadequate given their other uh, commitments and interests and expenses um, to, to bringing the United States back into line. Uh, I think that's a very, very important thing that we'll, we'll come back to in this discussion. But the point is simply that there was no way that the Brits could not have recognized that the United States was a great threat. And so they took action, um, uh, along the lines that they took it everywhere else, uh, in order to subvert and control that country indirectly, as indeed the United States does with so many countries today. As for, um, uh, AA's points, um, the first thing that we need, or more generally, we just need to clarify about um, Yankees. Um, Yankees are from New England, the um, craziest utopian ideals from suffrage to abolitionism and everything else flowed um, from New England. And as was covered by Bagby in AA stream about the War of 1812, when all that happened, the uh, the damned New Englanders would not come to the the assistance of the rest of the the states in fighting with the British. They basically dragged their heels and sat back and uh, and and didn't really come uh, into the fight in the way that um, we would have expected or that today we would have imagined they would. And that's because they were Yankees. They considered themselves um, English. Uh, by descent, um, the, the the vast majority of uh, the churches in that region uh, were, and to, to this day, you can still see the vestiges of it, they were Episcopal, which is to say Church of England. And what's interesting is that in Britain itself, they call um, all Americans Yanks, because in terms of people coming for road scholarships or, you know, butchers from Chicago who are billionaires, whose daughter daughters get married in order to get some money uh, by British aristocrats. The the people that they're familiar with, the ones they interact with, um, were all Yankees. And so the Brits themselves think of the entire United States as Yanks. Uh, it is my view that uh, Britain was a major force fomenting the war between the states, and they didn't know who to put their money on uh, for sure. But in the end, they succeeded um, in... Um, and, and, and uh, in, in so far as they wanted to subvert the country uh, and the uh, Ang Anglos from the north uh, emerged supreme, which is when we then get the Gilded Age and significantly uh, what's called the great uh, British uh, and American rapprochement, um, at which point um, the game was pretty much over and uh, Britain had established um, a not always solid, but fairly continuous uh, domination over the United States, particularly with foreign direct investment, railroads, uh, people like J.P. Morgan, uh, and the rest that we can get into if you guys um, uh, desire. In terms of the United States being anti-European and anti-British, uh, the United States had a strong uh, isolationist uh, stance, and it was only through extensive manipulations um, uh, wrangling, skullduggery, uh, bribes, uh, and direct pressure 
uh, particularly with the use of uh, spies and all sorts of uh, uh, intelligence manipulations that Britain succeeded in dragging the United States into World War I. And they had uh, similar issues with dragging it into uh, World War II on their behalf. And if you look even earlier, you'll see that from the period of the 1890s, um, again, this great rapprochement, uh, there was major pressure to bring the United States online as a kind of uh, lieutenant as a kind of Pacific policeman, uh, a subject that I, I know you know quite a bit about, uh, AM. Another uh, point that I wanted to bring up, uh, basically uh, relevant to the, the thing of uh, what AA was saying about how woke turns things upside down, I, f I find it very interesting that he uses the term inversion uh, because I agree with him. And that's exactly what it was. It, was it, it has been a kind of inversion, but my argument, I know AA is aware of it. I know he disagrees with me and that's perfectly fine. But the, the whole idea of the Saturnalia in ancient Rome w was that you turned all of society entirely on its head. Up becomes down, left becomes right. Everything is entirely inverted. And what is the fundamental feature of that? To free the slaves and make of the masters. And so when AA talks about how it was really the U.S. that brought that woke thing in, I point, as I've done in the past, to the massive propaganda campaigns and the massive cynical uh, exploitation of the abolition movement um, for its own uh, power manipulations undertaken uh, by Britain. Their, the, the, the whole idea of taking an entire culture and demanding that the slaves be freed and be given uh, rights um, along the lines of everyone else is, is, is the textbook for me is like an archetypal form, uh, of woke. And as for the empire being run for the benefit, uh, of its various, um, uh, uh, of the white people in it, um, or even the people in the various regions under British administration, I'd, I'd have to point to, um, South Africa where we see, uh, the Brits um, basically coming in with roads, uh, just as we see with uh, oligarchs today, uh, like Soros and their color rev revolutions and games. The Brits came in uh, for, for, for little more than concern about trade routes uh, and a huge amount of gold, uh, as it happens. You have things like the Jameson Raid, where they basically go in and try to astroturf a coup in uh, the Transvaal, you know, with the Boers, and and it, it, they blow it. But of course, they it all gets covered up when there's a when there's a government inquiry back in Britain, just as it does today. Um, and you saw the slaves freed there, and the uh, Boers, uh, in, in innovative uh, ways, uh, put into concentration camps. So the idea that the empire was entirely um, a, a, a benign force. Um, seems to me rather preposterous, as does the idea that it was, uh, you know, run uh, based on anything other than uh, desire for profit and cold calculations about geostrategic realities. I hasten to add that I do not believe the United States is any different, and I am not attempting to say that one or the other is, uh, you know, more morally culpable or uh, more unpleasant. So those are some basic points I wanted to make. Uh, before, sorry, before I bring you in, a, I just want to contextualize some of what you said and push back against some things. Um, in terms of subversion, it goes both ways. And in terms of the War of 1812, um, I don't think it's that clear cut. So in terms of the peace treaty in the 1780s, which creates the United States, on the one hand, the British are reeling from the fact that this represents a fundamental challenge to monarchy. In my view, this represents almost a repeat of the situation with the English Civil War in terms of regicide. However, of course, this is um, a severance rather than an elimination of a monarch. And you can see this represented in terms of the ideas of the revolution as a form of extreme wiggery, which I would contrast with the views, say, for example, of the levelers, who also represented Monarchamac and uh, uh, 
pre-revolutionary ideas of, or sorry, a revolutionary ideas of popular sovereignty, etc. So that's also important to consider in terms of what the United States represents, in terms of it being a radical weak force, which is in some way um, representative of the English Empire or the British Empire, but in some way antithetical to other elements of it. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is that the British awarded in that peace settlement vast amounts of territory to the United States, which they didn't have to grant in Appalachia, uh, precisely because of economic penetration and the fact that Britain would no longer have to be responsible for the development of these territories, which in some ways plays into your idea of Semiogog, but also detracts from it. The idea that the British were exploiting it for commercial ties, yet they were also inexplicably, you can say, in terms of the long-term effects of it, building it up. In terms of 1812, there is the fact that the United States was preemptively attacking Canada, so the British would not have a foothold from which to attack them again. There is also the idea that this is simply a theatre within the broader war against France. The Americans were being press-ganged into the Royal Navy, and there was a ideological fidelity between the ideas expressed in America. Indeed, the French were responsible in many ways for the creation of an independent America through funds and through direct military intervention. And this correlates with Napoleon's foreign policy and ultimately the policies of James Madison, just to add a bit of context there. To push back slightly on the notion of Yankees, there isn't undeniably an Episcopalian element, yet there is also a strong nonconformist tradition Going beyond New England in terms of Pennsylvania, Penn, who is responsible for the creation of it, was of course a Quaker. And his situation arrives out of that of uh, dissenting from the established church during the reign of James II. The state of Massachusetts, for example, was very anti, very anti monarchy, even though Episcopalianism represents in many ways a vindication of monarchy and the extension of that settlement. Um, and also, in terms of the South representing this preservation, or sorry, continuation of the cavalier spirit, I would say there was a uh, Anglophile aristocracy in the South. And so you bring up things like uh, the question of woke and the question of slavery. And I tend to devolve this, uh, bring this back to hard power politics. The question of slavery in 1807 was very much predicated on the fact that this was suffocating the French empire, any attempts to reconquer Haiti. This was also an attempt to stymie the growth of the US economy. Yet at the same time, when we bring this to the war, the American Civil War, the British were in a impossible situation. On the one hand, uh, supporting, say, for example, the slaves in the South, would undermine America in theory, but they were also part of the Confederacy, which the British, ideally, in terms of their own self-interest, would prop up to negate the United States as a potential threat. So just some thoughts regarding that situation, very, very brief thoughts. But AA, finally, because um, you haven't spoken for a while, uh, please come in and offer your thoughts. Yeah, so I wanted to pick up on um, one thing that you uh, said AM, and then I'll... Uh pick up on some of the things Semyagog said. Um, when you said it's a series of different empires, I agree with that. Um, in fact, I have a book here, which I, I shared on uh, Twitter called Britain's Empires, a history from 1600 to 2020 by a Marxist called James Hartfield. Um, even though he's a Marxist, he's kind of a kind of a based Marxist, if there can be such a thing. Um, but this is a, he has a very good thesis in this book where he says that the British Empire was a series of actually quite distinct things. And the way he categorizes it is the old colonial system from 1600 to 1776. Okay, so if you can imagine, like, we're going from the Elizabethan era down to the American, you know, American independence. Uh, then he uh, has a period called the Empire of Free Trade, 1776 to 1870. So that's you know, through the Napoleonic Wars and then, you know, the, uh, you know, into Victoria. Um, then he has what is called the New Imperialism, 1870 to 1945, which coincides with, you know, both the world wars and decline. Um, then he has a period called decolonization, 1945 to 1990, um, where he talks about the Commonwealth. And interestingly, he has a thesis that that is a kind of shadow empire that he uses the language of human rights and international law to exert all sorts of kind of insidious pressures on 
different things basically what we would call the gay right um in tandem with american power the uh, britain uses the commonwealth um to uh, as a kind of as a kind of proxy for those sorts of values uh, which is in, which is something that you've talked about at length am in your amazing obituary for queen elizabeth ii right i mean it's basically that process that he described but he's doing it from a left wing point of view um and then he talks about the era of humanitarian intervention basically the you know 1990 to the present post berlin wall uh, which is really the period where what we call the gay has really come into its own and shown its true face. Um, and I, I do think that those distinctions are useful um, because the nature of each of those quote unquote empires is quite different um, uh, as we as we can get on to. Um, in terms of Semiagog's characterization of the British Empire, I actually agree with it. I, I, w I was not suggesting that the British Empire was benign. I do agree that it was ruthless, self-interested, run for profit, um, and, uh, you know, did all sorts of skullduggery, as, as you described it. Um, and it was exploitative, without doubt. Uh, I would say that the, the zenith of that sort of activity is what Hartfield calls the, the empire of free trade. Okay, so... I, you know, after the point where America is its own country, this period from 1776 to 1870, characterized historically as a, as a period of laissez-faire, especially after the Napoleonic Wars, um, I believe that laissez-faire was a, a kind of mask. It wasn't a real ideology. It was a cunning, the, I, I, sorry to bring up economics here, but it's, it is quite important. The the Ricardan doctrine, the law of comparative advantage, or the law of association, as Mises calls it, where you have specialized, each area is specialized for production of different things, right? So, I mean, classically, you'd think of, I don't know, Ireland, that does potatoes. This, uh, you know, this country in Africa, you know, Ghana does, like, chocolate this this place does tobacco this place does and um this language of free quote unquote free trade actually masks what was a very cunning system whereby these various dominions under the guise of specialization under the division of labor essentially is just locked into an overdependence on growing one or two raw cash crops, right, which are then transported to England and well, to Wales and Scotland, etc., but mainly to England um, and process into manufactured finished goods and then sold back out. So you can see that even though it's called free trade, it is free trade in which it is um, the there's a kind of foot on the scales. It's like, okay, well, it just so happens that in almost every case, it is Britain that's doing the manufacturing and the various dominions that are doing the the, pro the production of raw uh, materials. And in fact, the America's, America's role in this, um, in, in the growth of the British Empire, is much underappreciated. Um, in my book, The Defenders of Liberty, which almost nobody has read, uh, I go, through, you know, I, I cover the 19th century and I show that after the repeal of the Corn Laws, uh, basically Britain was fed by American grain, huge imports of American grain. Um, and I have a list here. I have a table showing imports of raw cotton to the UK from the United States from 1840 to 1862. We're talking huge quantities of raw cotton grown in America. And then manufactured here, so it's American cotton, brought here, manufactured, uh, you know, turned into a finished good, and then sold back out using "quote unquote" free trade. Um, and 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 in many cases, what the what the British government would do is it would, um, you know, you, you'd get a you'd get a private company, "quote unquote" private company, and then a deal would be made with 
the local monarch or whoever it happened to be to lock in that country essentially to a monopoly deal, right? I mean, so it looks like, like on paper, you'd say, well, okay, this is a lovely free trade area. But if you actually look into each of the individual industries, it's not like you've got kind of, you know, runaway capitalism with competing entities and so on. You've got countries which are locked into extremely exploitative monopoly contracts, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I would say that all of that was done for the benefit of the British economy and for the benefit of uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the subjects of the British of the British Empire. Where I contrast that with the where I disagree with Semyagog is the idea that the American Empire is running along those lines. I do not believe the American Empire um, is kind of extractive in that way for the benefit of Americans. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, you just have to look at what it does. I mean, it, it literally does the exact opposite. You've, you've got American companies um, basically funding foreign direct investment in China and various other places, exporting the jobs and importing the finished goods. With the only people benefit benefiting from the whole thing being Wall Street or the you know the finance the financial sector, so if I was to disagree anywhere, it is that Britain in many like if you look at that British Empire, it was a classic extractive exploitative empire. When you strip away the kind of fuzz of laissez faire and free trade do doctrine, it was actually just raw power politics. Um, you know, with a veneer of kind of economic bullshit on top of it. Where, whereas if you look at what the American empire does, it, it's very difficult to see how it, it actually is benefit. Because don't forget, with all of those various deals that they were cutting and the, the, the import of the raw cotton and the manufacturing, those were jobs. Those were, you know, that was feeding families. That was making people richer. It was like a 90% increase in wages, um, you know, from 1800 to 1900. You know, Milton Friedman would tell you that's the glory of the free market. <laughs> Leaning on, you know, a country like India to, you know, stymie its uh, textile manufactured uh, manufacturers so that they have to buy British fin finished goods, right? And so, you know, and you see them do that everywhere. Whereas I don't see the American empire doing that. I see the American empire kind of unmoored in a way um, from... The process by which the jobs, the manufacturers, and things come back to America, that was happening at one point, but it's not happening anymore. And and in fact, what it has done to all of its dominions, by which I mean Europe, Britain, uh, etc., is that it has basically forced all of those countries to give up its manufacturers. Uh, the only one that resisted for any amount of time was Germany, and even that is being lent on heavily to uh, become, you know, what do they call it, a service economy. Um, so, you know, that would be my contention, really, where, where, where the difference is. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about with that later period, because, I mean, I think it's a story of betrayal. I think it's a story of subversion from elites from within um, and, and so on. But I don't know if you wanted to come back on any of that, either of you. Uh, just just before I, uh, I let Samuel speak, I, I just want to add uh, to, to, to a lot of um, very interesting points and a lot of very insightful points regarding the economic nature of the British Empire, because I think that's fundamental in terms of understanding the British Empire in particular, which is a commercial empire, especially in the 19th century, I believe the commercial aspect of the British Empire um, supersedes anything else in terms of any sort of institutional fidelity or ideological commitment to any sort of process of universal government. So I think that's a very important point to make. Um, but I would only want to flesh out um, that more by, we look at the physical empire, where say, for example, you talk about the division of labor among the various colonies. And I think it's also important to understand, say, for example, the process of ruthless exploitation in terms of the transition of the East India Company to the Sepoy Rebellion, to the establishment of a crown colony and the creation of viceroys in India. But there's a fundamental element whereby the British are 
also controlling other states by proxy. And this feeds into the idea of the creation of international law, which again compounds the idea of free trade. So again, in terms of the American empires and the British empires actually being run in tandem, the Monroe Doctrine is a very good example of this. Because George Canning, the then British Foreign Secretary and then briefly Prime Minister in the 1820s, rather than contrasting this idea that the Americans should act basically as a hegemon, preventing European recolonization, he latches on to this. Why? Because the Spanish Empire has dissolved in Latin America, and this gives the British a brilliant pretext from which to economically integrate Latin America into this idea of a commercial empire. Argentina is the most extreme example of this in terms of, again, building into this idea of division of labor, AA, where the beef market essentially is and, and not only that, in terms of the dependency of um, uh, Argentine beef and the relationship to the United Kingdom as a purchaser, but in terms of also artificially inflating that economy to the point that when the British economy suffers as a result of World War One, the Argentinian eco economy by extension fails. And in terms of commerce superseding everything else, the British had attempted to actually take physical colonies in Latin America during the War of Jenkins' Ear, and this policy proved to be far more effective. And beyond this, when we're talking, say, for example, about the correlation between international law and the exploitation of um, free trade, one can look, say, for example, at figures like Palmerston and see the origins of neoconservatism, that being expanding the scope of the British Empire, making it universalist and integrating all of these facets into the global economy. And China is the most obvious example. And then, as you know, AA, we can point to other examples, such as the Ottoman Empire, where the British effectively retain control over these economies. Where the United States try to subvert this process is through the policy of the open door, pitting all the various empires, not just Britain, but France, Germany, and even places like Austria-Hungary against each other. So the Americans would be able to penetrate these economic areas and be able to break the British monopoly. Um, so just to augment some of your points, AA, but Semigog, would you like to um, come back into the conversation? Yes. Uh, first thing to note is that it was free trade, um, as I think both of you are well aware, probably most of the listeners are well aware, because that simply enshrined British naval dominance. And it was free trade for everything except slaves, um, which was, you know, mandated from on high as part of a woke agenda by the, uh, by the Brits. Um, the, the next thing I would say relative to economics is that AA paints a picture there that is, um, you know, generally speaking accurate, of course, and I would not go uh, toe to toe with him as regards uh, economics in any way. That would be like me going up against you uh, as regards uh, history. But from what I have recently read, um, the British maintained a very strong policy of foreign direct investment. There was massive investment into the U.S. Oddly enough, right after uh, the uh, the the settlement of the war between the states, uh, you know, starting about uh, 1870. Uh, and we can get into some of the uh, bankers involved who went from uh, New England to uh, Britain uh, and eventually um, led to the, 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 the House of Morgan. Um, but the, there was massive uh, British foreign direct investment, basically because they had to bring in so many raw materials, as A pointed out, um, they had a trade deficit in that respect. The thing is that they invested heavily in industry in other countries, uh, specifically in the United States, uh, as well as, of course, others. And that meant that at the end, uh, they had income from that as well, which uh, balanced out uh, and actually led to quite a nice profit, uh, the issues involved with having to bring their raw materials uh, in from elsewhere. Uh, in terms of uh, Indian textiles, um, I was just looking into that, and uh, they point out uh, that the, you know, cotton was uh, first domesticated in India. Uh, they have an ancient textile trade. Um, there was uh, a, a, a native Indian textile production from uh, in the years prior to 1830. Um, then there was a steady uh, decline from a high in the 1790s. Uh, 1830 to 1850 exports stagnated while the growth of imports from Britain came in but it was arguably not greater than the growth of uh, domestic demand due to uh, population growth. 1850 to 1880 saw accelerating textile imports, but at the same time, the foundation of a domestic manufacturing industry where the uh, Brits were setting up textile mills there. Um, uh, at the end of the 1880-1913 period, uh, at the end of which imports peaked, um, uh, 
then there's the 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 post nineteen thirteen period when domestic manufacturing dominated uh, uh, both imports uh, and uh, hand weaving. So the the picture, this idea that that the the, the Brits brought it all back home, and in in, in that respect, um, had the the. The, the living conditions of their subjects uh, foremost uh, in mind, it's it's not quite that clear a picture. Um, the other thing about the United States and how you know we've jobbed everything out. I, I grew up in the eighties. Um, I, I was a teenager in the eighties, and there was plenty of U.S. manufacturing. Life was very very good indeed for um, someone coming up in the United States. It certainly was uh, for me. So the important thing to underscore here is that the Brits, because it was a commercial empire, they they invested their money everywhere. Even if you look today in the United States, the foreign direct investment from uh, Britain is at number two behind only Japan. But if you put the foreign direct investment of Canada and Britain together, it eclipses entirely um, the uh, investment from Japan. Uh, so... Uh, I've tried to look for earlier figures, but prior to about 1914, there it's basically just educated guesses about foreign direct investment. But uh, from what I've seen about looking into the history of the J.P. Morgan uh, banking house and its uh, predecessors, um, there there's massive, massive um, uh, railroad investment, among other things, on, on the part of the Brits, which is of course about linking the Atlantic with the Pacific. Um, and uh, also, interestingly enough, is where we first see the Americans doing um, uh, uh, the the British thing of, of moving populations from Asia um, in order to pr provide uh, labor, um, which again I think is under Anglo um, uh, influence. Um, one, one quick thing to mention about that earlier, uh, quite right, yes, there are Anabaptists and all sorts of nonconformists and the rest in New England, but what I had reference to was the ones who actually wield power. For example, the ones who are members of the Episcopal um, Church Club in New York, put together by uh, J.P. Morgan and attended, for example, by the uh, Roosevelts. And we'll get into J.P. Morgan, I'm sure, later when we start talking about who sub subverted whom. Um, but the main point here, oh, and one last thing about uh, the open door. Uh, my understanding from my review of the historical documents, and uh, you know, it's possible I misunderstand them. It's possible I don't have sufficient context because I've been cramming for a while. But the open door policy seemed to, uh, to suit um, Britain uh, quite well. Um, and it was not um, a thing that opened up, uh, as, insofar as I understand it, opened up uh, China um, for, for strictly for American benefit over uh, British objections. Those are just a, a few things there for you. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, just to, uh, if you remember the, the, the cutoff point for that period I was talking about was 1870. Um, and what Semigog is saying is quite right about the increased foreign direct investment from London um, after that point. One of the reasons is that was a, there was an economic downturn in the 1870s. I have figures here. British exports um, declined from uh, 311 million in 1873 to 245 million in 1878. And in fact, so bad was this uh, kind of economic uh, you know, de de depression pretty much. Uh, you know, there, there was a great uh, deflation uh, during this period as well, that there was actually uh, a rise in emigration from Britain during this time. Um, uh, in fact, uh, 200,000 people were leaving the country every year uh, in, in the 1880s. And uh, I have a, um, I have a, uh, um, I mean, there's a chapter in this book called Little England Exhausted, right? Uh, i.e. the Industrial Revolution it was rocking and rolling, things were going great, you know, during that, that earlier period. By this point, um, you know, there was a kind of economic shock pretty much. And the the capitalists, if you want to put it that way, your, you know, Rothschilds and Morgans and so on, um, they were looking for ways of making bank um, that did not rely on the old model of, you know, importing the raw, importing the raw materials, manufacturing it in Britain, 
and exporting elsewhere. So that process that I was talking about that the United States engages in today, you know, setting up factories in China and so on, pretty much has a parallel here. And in fact, there's a very interesting table, which is illustrative, that shows that uh, in 1880, Britain's share of world manufacturing output was 22.9%. Um, United States was 14.7%. Okay. Germany was 8.5%. France was 78 by 1900, that's 20 years later, uh, Britain's manufacturing output had declined to 18.5% and had been overtaken by the United States, 23.6%, Germany, 13.2%, France, 6.8%. And the, by 1913, you know, on the, you know, just before the uh, World War I, uh, Britain's uh, manufacturing output had decreased to 13.6%. Of the of the of the world's total, America by that point thirty two percent, Germany fourteen point eight percent, and France six point one. Um, and you're quite right, Semyagog, to point out that on paper this looks like the United States is winning. Right, we're winning, guys. We're doing really well. Um, but actually, if you follow the money, huge amounts of that um, investment were actually loans that were raised in london uh you know with interest with interest going back to london so you do get this financialization and arguably this is the point uh at which um the benefits reaped back home were much less than they had been in the previous era so i mean i would argue that this period that we're looking at here just before world war one in for the ordinary Brit, um, you know, you could argue was one of decline. I mean, if people are emigrating, that means that the chance, like the opportunities at home were less than they used to be, right? Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at the numbers, the number of Brits who went to America during this period was pretty big. Um, America received 1.3 million people from uh no it, it received 622,000 people from britain between 1904 and 1913 it's quite a big number and they're not all irish either um and uh 1.3 million people emigrated from britain to the colonies i.e maybe i'll get a better standard life like you know in India or something like that. So there were there were quite a lot of people uh, who who just left during that time for one reason or another. Um, so it's kind of interesting because the British Empire, if you think about it, becomes more international. Do you think, do you think that's the right word? Am it's, it's more international. It's be, it's becoming more like less focused on England itself and more kind of you know it's it's becoming a bit more. Glo global globalized I, I don't know what the right word is i, I, I think uh, in yeah. terms of i mean there are a lot of ideas one can draw from this and again a thank you for bringing up these points on the one hand one has to sort of almost view the history of the british isles and the history of british of the british empire so to speak as much as we can use that term as two different things in terms of this idea of international or global uh, global elite or trying to make the empire almost divorced from the idea of a little England and becoming something else, uh, you can look at it both ways. In terms of emigration, you could almost see it as a success of the British Empire in the sense that emigrating out into the col migrating out into the colonies actually cements this idea of establishing a anglo imperial elite and the immigration to the united states may actually buttress semagogue's point in terms of this idea of mutual dependency and possibly subversion um so i think there are two angles on the one hand you're having an elite which is becoming far more deracinated i .e. there is little connection to the homeland and thereby they are taking on a more internationalist perspective yet on the one hand you can say this facilitates the idea of imperial consolidation which leads up to the ideas before the first world war where we're talking about about abandoning free trade in the form of imperial preference, the idea of an imperial federation incorporating all the dominions of the empire into a new superstructure. Um, so I think it's very important to look at these points of the round and say, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, sorry, I am as well. 
um, there's something else that happens during this exact period that I'm talking about, which from from one point of view looks like it's kind of decline, but from another point of view is a great expansion. I'm talking about the scramble for Africa. I mean, I've got date. I mean, I've got dates here. It's not just Africa. It is 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 also the period in which Britain basically starts running the Middle East. You know, you've got um, Ashanti for, acquired in 1901, uh, Gambia 1888, um, uh, Lagos 1899, Niger Coast became a protectorate 1898, Egypt a veiled protectorate, quote unquote. 1882, Sudan, 1882, Zanzibar, 1888, East Africa becomes a protectorate, 1895, Uganda, Somali coast. I mean, all of these places, British Central Africa, Zululand. Uh, I mean, there's so many of them. Um, so that there is a pretty big expansion in terms of actual territories that are under either direct British control or a protectorate, or, you know, it's basically under, it's on that map that right there. Um, and this could account for some of that emigration as well, because obviously people were needed to run those places. And it could be kind of an exciting opportunity for you, I guess. You know? No, I, I completely concur with your points. I, I, I just want to sort of, again, as I am prone to do, just add a bit of context here. This map, um, does not represent the British Empire at any point. Rather, this represents the types of colony, the types of control, the types of protectorate, um, and the territory that the British Empire held throughout the entire duration of its history. So you can see Oregon and the 13 colonies here also represent this part of the British Empire. Uh, but as you can see, we have Egypt and the states in the Middle East, as A has been talking about. And this is actually cemented after World War One with the Sykes-Picot Agreement. If you look at India, this again represents another form of empire contained within the patrimony of rural Britannia, whereby we retain elements of the imperial superstructure, which the British essentially conquered and inherited, which is that of the Mughal superstructure, combined with protectorates, which basically assimilate the local Indian elites into um, a formalized system of power. In many, my contention has always been that there would never be, there wouldn't be a modern state of India had it not been for the British, as controversial as that opinion may be. And you're quite right in also bringing up the scramble of Africa, and this in many ways sort of counteracting the effects of the Great Depression in the 1870s. And in terms of imperial consolidation, this is actually necessary for the continuation of the empire. In the 1880s, Gladstone is responsible for occupying Egypt. And then, for example, afterwards, as you mentioned, the Sudan, um, there is the creation of the Egyptian British co-dominion, which essentially just means British possession in Sudan. Uh, as you can see, the British actually won the scramble of Africa, being able to intersect all of these territories as Cecil Rhodes would say, from Cairo to Cape. And compared to that, the French essentially just controlled the Sahara. And after the First World War, the British essentially take over the German possessions and also the Middle Eastern possessions, or much of them, combined with that of the French possession in Syria and Lebanon. So in terms of providing opportunities, providing new markets, this correlates to the idea you brought up earlier, A, which is that of new imperialism, this representing a, another stage in terms of the uh, history of the British Empire. And indeed, as you mentioned earlier, Semigog, the exploitation of South Africa also provides new means of consolidating territories into a federal superstructure, incorporating many disparate peoples. Um, include, and of course, as you mentioned earlier, the idea of importing various populations in the East. And this isn't just... Um, we have Chinese populations being important to South Africa. We have Indian populations being moved into Uganda and Kenya. So, and this is a very consistent policy regarding the history of empire. So the Byzantine Empire, say for example, would move troublesome groups from one area and put them on the frontier, essentially forming buffer groups. So in this sense, you can say the British Empire is a quintessential empire. It is undermining local groups of power, and it is also providing a aristocratic superstructure through the exploitation of British elites throughout the whole course of the empire. So just to provide a bit of context. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just wanted to add one more thing as well, which is one of my more controversial takes, I would say. In exactly the same way, it's my contention that what Semigog was painting as a kind of 
slightly clandestine attempt to influence what was happening in America by uh, financial elites in London through all of this foreign direct investment and so on. Uh, because, I mean, what they hoped to do was gain control, right? S sneakily gaining control of like the American economy and things like that. Um, I actually think has a complete mirror in American policy in the modern era towards China since um, since Kissinger and Nixon. Do you remember when Nixon went over to China and shook hands with Mao and um, that that began that began, you know, what everybody's familiar with today, which is the period of you know American investment in China in exchange for for TAT essentially. Okay, um, I and and what's happened is that that has built up China into being like a like a superpower that is now challenging American dominance in the world. I believe that the British made, and I believe that to be a mistake by the Americans, to, to be clear. Um, I believe the British made exactly the same mistake uh, in this period here that we're talking about with all of its investments in, in America and essentially created the, the kind of infrastructure, capital, momentum for the America that came to dislodge it as the global superpower. Uh, it's kind of you know history doesn't repeat it rhymes people say i believe that that is essentially what happened um but uh, i don't know if you have any views on that semi -agog. um just before i bring semi -agog in sorry semi -agog, I, I just want to because that's a very interesting point you bring up and i think this also it establishes a time limit on the british empire because the british are establishing economic zones in terms of their formal exploitation. They are also building up potential rivals in order for them to eventually resist the British Empire. The pursuance of free trade ultimately reverberates back onto the British Empire. So in terms of the commercial nature of the British Empire almost being antithetical to the continuation of a British Empire, which may seem contradictory, I think this also plays into the idea that Britain was always an empire against empire both in the sort of universal Christian sense, but in terms of it becoming self-defeating as an enterprise. In terms of looking at aspects such as Magna Carta, Magna Carta represents English imperialism against the papacy. This is confirmed when we have Henry VIII's Restraint of Appeals, which is a rejection of the imperialism offered both by Charles V as Holy Roman Emperor and Clement VII. Elizabeth, her whole foreign policy is bent on destroying the Spanish Empire and being able to form a economic coalition, a religious coalition with the Netherlands. In the same way that British foreign policy against Europe is predicated on the destruction of European empires, so baked into this idea of the inherent commercialism of the British Empire is building up its various rivals. And I think this also fundamentally points to something the United States has, which Britain does not. Britain as a series of islands, as you can see, so, um, so removed from the rest of its colonies, it's fundamentally a maritime empire. So when its maritime power becomes superseded by that of the United States, the whole ability of the empire to endure is fundamentally compromised. And what the United States has vis-a-vis -vis the British Empire is a continuous territory, which you can also say for the Soviet Union. But Semigog, please come in, because I've spoken too long here. Not at all. Um, I think this might be a good time, stop me if I'm wrong, to bring in uh, a, a, a number of important points that are central to uh, my view of this, which is that we're not talking about Britain versus the United States. We're talking about a group of um, Anglo-American elites who want uh, uh, to, to control the world. Uh, and they have done um, as, uh, as a paired grouping since at least uh, around 1900. Um, that, that is my view. And I think there is a very, very uh, strong case to be made for that. I should also add that I believe that there is a Dutch financial component to this. And of course, there's the Jewish financial component to this. The Dutch, I have not been able to pin down and um, learn enough about to introduce it, but there should be a, a, a flag stuck in the map somewhere, you know, uh, to, to come back to that uh, subject later. Furthermore, I believe that the whole point of this, um, of this Anglo-American um, grouping that first exploited uh, Britain 
and then uh, eventually Britain and the United States, their tax bases more specifically. Um, the whole point of it was uh, to pay the damn bills, to keep to build the, the warships, to um, to roll the steel, to produce them, to um, have them uh, r roll down whatever those stays, lays, I can't remember what they're called, from the shipyards into the water. Um, they needed a tax base that was sufficient to run this damn uh, naval power uh, operation. And so you see um, a speech in a speech by Joseph Chamberlain is a famous quote. I can't figure out. It's cited as 1902. Somebody found uh, uh, the full text of the speech and it looks like it's from 1898. So I can't be sure about the date of it, but it's a colonial conference. And Joseph Chamberlain says, the weary Titan staggers under the too vast orb of its fate. We have borne the burden for many years. We think it is time that our children should assist us to support it. And so what people naturally imagine at that point is that it's it's all about the creation of the Commonwealth, and that doesn't have anything to do with the United States. Well, there's an important little bit, if you'll uh, bear with me, from Carol Quigley's book, The Anglo-American Establishment, where he says... Um, um, <clears throat> The development of the British Empire into the Commonwealth of Nations and the role which the Milner Group played in this development cannot be understood by anyone who feels that federation and commonwealth were mutually exclusive ideas. In fact, there were not two ideas, but three, and they were not regarded by the group, and we'll talk more about this group later. Um, they're not regarded, let, let, suffice it to say that it's a group of uh, uh, British power players who aimed from the beginning to subvert American ones, uh, and, um, well, we'll get into all of that, but he says, in fact, there were not two ideas, but three, and they were not regarded by the group as substitutes for each other, but as supplements to each other. These three ideas were one, the creation of a common ideology and world outlook among the peoples of the United Kingdom, the empire and the United States. Two, the creation of instruments and practices of cooperation among these various communities in order that they might pursue parallel policies. And three, the creation of a federation on an imperial Anglo-American or world basis. The Milner Group regarded these as supplementary to one another and worked vigorously for all of them without believing that they were mutually exclusive alternatives. They always realized, even the most fanatical of them, that federation, even of the empire only, was very remote. They always, in this connection, used such expressions as not in our lifetime or not in the present century. They always insisted that the basic unity of any system must rest on common ideology, and they worked in this direction through road scholarships, the roundtable groups, and the uh, Institute of International Affairs, even when they were ardently seeking to create organized constitutional relationships. So we see that there's this idea uh, of, of the, the, the empire b having empty coffers and needing to... Uh, uh, others to help carry that burden. The problem is that in the colonies, um, or uh, what later came to be known as the Commonwealth, again, not in the sense that it's uh, usually considered, um, many of them were sick of it. And the, the Milner group, the Rhodes group, and to some extent, the Cecil group, um, th th they were uh, saddened to learn that, uh, you know, for example, the Australians didn't necessarily want to carry that weight. Um, and so I believe that one of the contingency plans that they had arranged early on um, and that they had been developing since at least the 1870s was to bring the United States online in that respect. In terms of foreign direct investment, you know, talking about, um, you know, steel, for example, Carnegie, it, when he was building his empire, which was based on railroads and uh, to a considerable extent, British investment, um, and, and he got his start uh, during during the war between the states, help, helping out with the uh, development of uh, the railroad infrastructure that would help carry um, the North to uh, victory. While Sherman was uh, down in the South dismantling the early railroads that had been put into uh, Georgia, um, the C Carnegie was for. Uh, the, all of the wealth of the Carnegie Corporation changed on the balance sheets from being a foreign direct investment to uh, a U.S. asset when Carnegie became a U.S. citizen. And it's important to remember that um, sometime later, Carnegie sold um, his steel operations to J.P. Morgan, who was funded by the Brits. 
And at that point, it was, I guess, the largest single purchase that had ever been made. And it turned Carnegie, uh, a Scotsman, um, uh, later an American, into the richest man in the world. And in order to understand that, we needed to take a look at the background of the Morgans. Um, uh, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius, whatever his damn name is, J.S. Morgan, um, got his break when one George Peabody took him as a partner in London. Peabody was from Massachusetts, and he headed off to Britain to make his fortune, starting out with a cotton business in uh, Liverpool. At any rate, um, he became a major player in running American investments, and after him, his, his partner, and, and he was a, a quiet background partner, Peabody was, uh, until his death. And by the way, Peabody, this American who helped with all this British investment in the U.S., he's, he's, he's buried in fucking Westminster Abbey. And, uh, and so Peabody um, takes on J.P. Morgan's father as, uh, as, a, as a partner. And then J.P. Morgan becomes this incredibly wealthy person uh, who c manages to like control finances, who can like force his way into the White House. Even, you know, I mean, uh, obviously things are going well with Hoover, uh, a president who uh, all his business ties were in Britain and was uh, beloved by the financial elites in Britain. Um, but we, we can get to when, when we could talk more about Morgan and uh, massive British investment and the whole idea of the North Atlantic and super wealthy people, you know, the Astors, um, uh, Carnegie, uh, J.P. Morgan, some of the Roosevelts in the background as uh, smaller players. We can get into all of that when we start talking about how the U.S. did not want to go into World War I and the, the, the Brits poured spies into the United States and money in order to get the U.S. to come in. There's probably quite a bit of that going on earlier with Roosevelt, whose great white fleet uh, was actually uh, not a problem at all for the Brits. They wanted him to uh, to patrol uh, the Pacific because they didn't care about nations anymore. They don't give a fuck about the native population of Britain or the native population of the United States. They want their bills paid and they want their empire, their quiet shadow empire. And so when the great white fleet of... Uh, of, of Roosevelt was going to do its thing where it traveled around the world, you know, to talk softly, carry a big stick and let everybody know that the U S were now uh, power players. They didn't have fucking coaling stations. They couldn't like reload their ships with coal. So they had to contract privately with, um, British, um, uh, vessels and supplies. So you've got this great white fleet that's supposedly all about America traveling around the world to basically secure uh, the sea lanes for Anglo-American trade, emphasis on Anglo at this point, truly. Uh, and they're followed around by a fleet of uh, British ships to keep them running because they don't have the stations abroad to uh, to coal up and do their thing. So I think it's very, very important that everyone understand that this isn't about the U.S. subverting Britain, in my view, or Britain subverting the U.S. It's about a group of Anglo-American elites who are perfectly happy, and uh, as well as um, Jewish financiers working with them. And I suspect Dutch, although I can't plug those elements into the picture. It's this group of people... Um, uh, 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 who seek to dominate the world. And we can get into uh, the Rhodes Group, uh, the Milner Group, uh, the Cecil Block, uh, the Morgans, uh, and the rest of them, if you like, uh, or rather when you like, um, because it bears uh, particularly on um, World War I, it bears on everybody's uh, deeply cherished illusion that it was that it was Wilson who created the League of Nations, when in fact it was Smuts from the uh, from the Milner Group who came rolling in just like Tony Blair would with pre-prepared paperwork, so that the League of Nations would be set up in order to enforce uh, British control of the seas and uh, maintain the status quo, as well as wring um, reparations uh, out of uh, Germany after uh, Versailles. Uh, we 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 also see that uh, in that case after World War One, uh, the Brits took over the uh, German colonial uh, possessions, uh, and the U.S. didn't get shit territorially, and they got screwed on being pay paid back their war debt by the Brits. Um, they got pennies on the dollar from that. Um, Balfour was a big fan of suggesting that uh, Britain would forgive all the war debt of these other allies if the U.S. would forgive its roughly um, um, equal war debt 
um, from uh, that was due from Britain. So the the U.S. taxpayers got screwed uh, funding that war, and 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 so we see that it's it's not about one country or the other. Both of the, them are getting uh, screwed by this group or these groups, I should say. Um, I, I mean, th thank you for that, Samir Gog. You brought up a lot of points. You've almost preempted um, a, a lot of the direction in which we're going regarding trans the transition from economy to foreign policy. But as you can obviously tell, the two are obviously interlinked, um, emphasizing the idea that beyond the British Empire, we talk about the commercial assets. Um, but and also the idea of centrifugalism, shadow elites, the expanded notion of a res publica, and a deracinated elite who owe no allegiance to either country. But I, I want to contextualize this as Britain and by extension, the gay, the global American empire as being the era of revolutions. So obviously we have the Protestant revolution, which results in the schism of Christendom. Um, at this time, the financial center of Europe is based in Antwerp. Antwerp um, is part of the Habsburg um, possessions in Burgundy, and a large contingent of the population is actually Sephardic Jews who have been forced out of Castile proper due to the beginning of the Inquisition and the Alhambra decrees, which are targeted at the Moriscos and Conversos, people who converted to Judaism. Of course, the fact the idea that the Spanish Empire is going to try and formally integrate Antwerp into this network essentially of the Spanish Empire results in a rebellion. Um, and in 1579, essentially Antwerp is superseded by Amsterdam, uh, which becomes the major financial center. In terms of putting this in the context of a trajectory for the British Empire, we really need to talk about Cromwell in terms of a figure of transition. I know we're going from the 21st, we're going from the 20th century and the 19th century back to this point, but in terms of creating a broad arc for all of this, all of this is relevant, especially in terms of creating the shadow groups, which you've alluded to, Semiagog. After the regicide of King Charles I, Cromwell is significant, not in terms of, uh, both in terms of projecting an imperial sort of um, uh, gravitas, which really no other figure in British history is able to project, both in terms of consolidating the gains of English imperialism within the British Isles themselves, obviously most notably in Ireland, uh, but also extending the British Empire out uh, into the Caribbean and essentially completing this idea of subverting the Spanish Empire by being able to establish British uh, as a naval as a naval power, but also establish the idea of a um, triangle trade and expanding commercial networks and interrelations with the colonies. In terms of expanding this idea, we also have the prohibition against Jews settling in the settling in England, which had been in place since Edward the First. Um, Cromwell intentionally rescinds this policy uh, so that the nascent British Empire is able to begin to imitate the Dutch. And then we see a series of wars with the Dutch during the reign of Charles II, which further confirms this transition from the Dutch essentially as representing the vessel for what you're talking about uh, to the British. And this is even represented in terms of the territorial annexations of the British Empire. The Dutch have attempted to expand into America. The Dutch have attempted to expand into the Far East. They have expanded into Brazil. And all of these colonial ventures, with the exception of the Far East, ultimately result in nothing. And Britain is able to transition New Amsterdam into the city of New York. In terms of a culmination of this idea of the Dutch being superseded by Britain as essentially representing this commercial hub, it's in 1795. Weirdly enough, the Dutch had been the one that had been a major financial backer for the United States Revolution, as had the French. But in 1795, as per the French Wars of Revolution, the Netherlands is occupied. And it's at that point where London really becomes the financial hegemon. Almost London is distinct as a financial entity, as a corporation, the Corporation of London uh, from the rest of Britain. And indeed, you can say it is the city of London, which has greater links with the British Empire and this commercial union uh, compared to the British themselves, especially this notion of a English nation. Um, so focus on the occupation of the Netherlands, but also that facilitates the expansion of the British Empire, the expansion of the British Empire into Ceylon, but also into South Africa, compounding this idea of South Africa in some ways as an instigator for imperial reform. And something I really want to get into before we talk about the potential subversion 
of British foreign policy getting us to World War One semigog. So uh, again, as I said, you preempted many of these points, and thank you for your research. Um, but I really want to talk about the abolition of slavery, less so the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, which I, I think, as we pointed out, there is an element of pre-wokeism in terms of Wilberforce and the liberal extreme Whig elements that are responsible for that. You can even say uh, negrophilic elements which are responsible for that. The idea that there is a fundamental contradiction in the British Empire between Britain where once one lands in Britain, essentially one breathes the free air and one is emancipated from slavery, how this contrasts with the colonies. And coming to this idea of expanding this notion of the abolition of the maritime slave trade into the wholesale abolition of slavery within the colonies, which takes place during the 1830s. So before we reach and compound the points which Semigog has alluded to here, um, I think I would like to start with AA here. Um, why do you think the British abolished slavery in the 1830s in the colonies? Um, well, I mean, my understanding is that it's it's essentially just uh, built on the contradiction in the law. Um, I'm trying to remember the date at which uh, slavery was actually abolished. I think it's like 11. When was slavery abolished by the Normans? Like 1100 is uh, the, the actual uh, date of it. So, well, well, if, well, official slavery within Europe was essentially essentially abolished just before slavery was reintroduced as per the Portuguese and the Spanish conquest, the new world. Um, and as you mentioned, this forms a fundamental contradiction in terms of the laws pertaining to the British Isles and the laws pertaining to the colonies. 11, 1171 is the official date that slavery was banned in, in England by the Normans. So. I mean, it's also interesting to compare that with the Muslim empires and this representing the height of the Crusades, just a, a tangential remark there. It seems to be a reaction against that. But anyway, continue, AA. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I, I think it's just that. Um, but I also think that there, I mean, it's liberalism, isn't it? Let's face it. Um, you can go back to the debates between uh, Carlyle and John Stuart Mill. And, you know, there there is a kind of... Um, you know, humanitarian, you know, it's just kind of liberalism 1.0, classical liberalism. Um, you know, if you want to be like ideologically consistent, you can't have this contract, you know, and if you want to, you know, in a, in a Christian sense, you know, there were debates over, you know, whether these people were human or not at one point. And once you accept that they are indeed human, it's kind of logically, you know, it logically then uh, leads to abolitionism. I was kind of, and and once you've set down the path of saying, well, our official ideology is this, you know, uh, you know, yeah, free trade is part of it, but liberalism writ large, um, you know, the uh, one of the classical liberals is called Herbert Spencer, um, and he has a, a notion that, you know, with uh, economic liberalism there also comes kind of social liberalism social progress moral progress so i mean this is kind of progressivism essentially you know original progressivism um you know it has its own logic so you know um yes but i mean is it really proto woke <laughs> i mean it's just like uh it's just kind of like saying well we don't believe in slavery well, yeah, well, fun kind of... well, fundamentally, I do believe it's proto-woke for, for reasons that actually compound your argumentation in terms of liberal social reform. Mm. Um, the period of the 1820s until the 1830s, and not only does it represent a repudiation of castle raised foreign policy in Europe, which was basically maintaining the status quo, upholding the idea of sovereign authority and undermining the notions of democracy, he commits suicide that whole idea is dispensed with, and Britain embarks a more activist foreign policy. And I believe the abolition of slavery thereby essentially allows Britain to consolidate its position by using the slavery argument to, say, for example, expand into Kenya, expand into Uganda, expand into Sudan, expand into Sokoto, which is the, um, the Islamic caliphate, which precedes British economic penetration, ultimately political control of Nigeria. So there's that contingent to it. And again, this is assuming a moralizing and you can say a, a universal 
force for woke in terms of mm -hmm. trying to understand this as a continuity. But in terms of reforms happening in England at this time, we're talking about the death of high Toryism. We're talking about the death of the monarchy as a viable institution. And we're also talking about the expansion of the franchise. At the same time, we're seeing mm -hmm. the abolition of slavery in the colonies. We're seeing the 1832 Great Reform Act, which begins this trajectory towards democracy, essentially, in terms of expanding the ability of the vote, first of all, to moneyed um, property owners, the idea of property being contingent for the responsibility in order to vote. But again, this idea keeps expanding, 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 especially when there is a political logic to expanding the franchise in order for the growing two-party system between Whigs and later Liberals and Conservatives to remain in power. And of course, in terms of a continuation of liberalism, we have Catholic emancipation as well, which is ironically introduced by a Tory prime minister who happens to be the Duke of Wellington. So all of these ideas are mulling around at the same time. And this, to me, represents a almost a revolution in terms of British politics. Gone are the old um, stalwarts from the Napoleonic era, Lord Liverpool, Herbert Spencer, even William Pitt the Younger, etc. And this is the beginning of the Victorian period, the 1830s. It is the beginning of, as you mentioned, really, the, the height of this free trade empire before leaning into new imperialism. And all of these social forces are coinciding. And from this, I, I think it's important really to talk about Britain as becoming a um, perennial subversive force in terms of expanding these ideas of liberalism already alluded to the idea of slavery as a subversive liberal force. And can again, I, can this, I yeah. throw in yeah, a very, sure. just yeah, sure. very, very short, just on slavery, because I sense you're about to expand it further, but just for people who are listening, who don't get it by, by outlawing slavery and policing the high seas to prevent it, to interdict it and to seize the vessels. I mean, just, just, just think about the, the, the wealth just from taking ships and cargoes. Um, which weren't always exclusively slaves. Um, you destroy the basis of the labor in many of the territories of the competitors. So France, I mean, look look at the wonderful things that happened in Haiti as a result of uh, these attitudes. Um, wh whether or not, I, I can't remember the, the period of the revolution, whether it falls immediately before, immediately uh, after Wilberforce and the rest. But the, the point nevertheless stands um, with... Um, you know the upheaval there. You you destroy the the labor basis of competitors like France, Spain, Portugal, and the U.S., and you also throw them into social upheaval based upon uh, virtue signaling, uh, victim status, and social conscience. Sorry, A. Uh, I, I, I should mention as well that if people are interested in this, I do have a video somewhere, controversial video, where I actually compare and contrast. I kind of have a really in-depth economic look at the life of a 19th century worker, wage laborer, uh, and a 19th century slave on a plantation. And I mean, uh, in terms of just raw costs, and in terms of, uh, in terms of what you get as the slave versus what you get as the worker, there, there, there isn't, it's a very strange argument. But if you think about it, the um, the boss of a you know the wage laborer boss who's who just pays you a wage actually has much fewer obligations to you as a worker. He can just fire you, right? He doesn't have to pay for your lodgings. He doesn't have to pay for your anything. Basically, um, he just pays you a wage. Um, Whereas the, I mean, a slave is an investment, right? And then what if something goes wrong? What if they break their leg? What if, you know, there's all sorts of things that come along with having to take on the role of actually kind of, quote unquote, looking after that person. It's like the other side. Everybody thinks of slavery as just being some people just being endlessly whipped into a pulp, right? But that, I mean, that's the modern depiction of it. And that's how we think of it. But but actually, it was a pretty evolved process. So there is, a, I mean, just to go along with your other thesis, Semiagog, of the of these capitalists, right? These capitalists, they're always looking to drive down certain costs all the time for themselves. So 
there's not there's an argument to say that they kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone when it, when it when it comes to this because they're not only knocking out the labor base of their competitors they're presenting themselves as liberators but they're they 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 actually managed to get somehow uh, like a you know I'm talking about like in America uh, when the uh, the actual abolition happened so many of the slaves like choosing to go back to the old plantations because life as a life as an actual you know you're just kind of flung onto the market looking for a job it, you know there's no security there's no there's lots of downsides for the quote unquote freed slave if that makes any sense because they essentially become um you know they have to deal with what carlisle calls the nomadism right so there is a, there's a weird way of looking at this that what is presented as abolitionism is 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 in fact a kind of way of uh I don't know, like they 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 get quite a few hidden benefits from it, if you're thinking of the the capitalist class per se. Um, does that make sense? Does no, make I, sense? I, yeah. I, th I think in terms of structuring, because I, I believe you're completely true, and I, this also this also has the wonderful sort of effect in terms of imperial management of breaking down structures which the British have essentially encountered when building up their empire and allowing them allowing them to create new structures of management and divide and rule. If you conceive of slavery essentially as holding a social system in power, which the British have to contend with, and allowing for the process of wholesale population transfer, I think that's another interesting point to bring out. The only exception I will bring to this rule, AA, I, you're familiar with it because I think you've also mm. done a video on it, is the example in Haiti. And why I believe the Haiti situation is distinct is possibly due to the prevalence of black nationalism, a very small French elite essentially who are cut off and a majority population which essentially tries to, which does effectively seize control based on the ideas of the French Revolution. And then the French are unable to take that colony back. So it's a mixed blessing. If there isn't essentially enough dissemination of the black population, it can overwhelm essentially this new system and create a situation like we see in Haiti. There is a, a funny note also to bring about that there is a expansion, a late expansion of slavery within the British Empire before the abolition, when we're talking about the Caribbean and places like British Honduras, Belize, that you can see on this map as well. And of course, the irony for France is compounded when one thinks that the idea of the abolition of slavery comes from France. France is the first major European nation to abolish slavery. It perhaps understands its mistake belatedly and then reintroduces slavery under Napoleon, but the damage has already been done. And the British are able to implement the abolition of slavery as a far more effective policy, ultimately designed against French imperialism. And when we see the continuation of French imperialism into Africa, it is very much done in the shadow of Britain. And this continues all the way up until Entente Cordiale. You could even say that this continues all the way up until 1956, where we see the crumbling infrastructure of the French Empire, that France is only permitted to exist at the whims of the British. But very interesting points you bring up, A, about the multifaceted nature of slavery. Uh, so I guess ju just before I go on a very quick trajectory getting us to World War One, regarding the specific points, Semigog, is there anything you want to bring up? Uh, yeah, just that it was, I mean, there's a, a thing, uh, Lives of the, uh, and Social Customs, I can't remember what it, what it is, Lives of the Americans or whatever by uh, Frances Trollope, the mother of the otherwise uh, well-known author, I think it's Anthony Trollope. And she talks about when she arrives in Louisiana in the 1830s and how the well-dressed black house slaves like mock um, white laborers. Um, and that's where we get in the United States, this idea of white trash, that they're, they're the, the, the lowest of the low. And later when she's somewhere further uh, east, um, she uh, talks about how she's staying at this one house and they find this uh, Irish laborer dying in a ditch and nobody knows his name or where he came from. Yeah, they, um, they discovered that it was much cheaper, you know, if the Irish guy um, was starving and died, um, it, it was much cheaper to just bring in another Irishman. Um, whom you owed uh, nothing whatsoever. The only thing I would say is that if you are going to jump to um, World War One, it's at least important to briefly mention 
this this whole Gilded Age thing and uh, the Brits, um, you know, the great rapprochement and the Brits pushing for the U.S. to develop a navy. And uh, uh, just just before I, because obviously you talk about 1880s and 1890s, I, I just want to bring us up to that point. I I, I don't mean to say I wanted to jump immediately ha, yes, to World War on. One, um, but, but uh, and just um, in terms of bringing up that point, obviously another aspect to bring in is the Irish question. The Irish question, which is in many ways going to prove fatal to the British Empire in terms of representing a ideological crisis, an economic crisis, an encumbrance for the British Empire, and in many ways the failure of the Unionist project and the success of Sinn Féin as being indicative towards the failure of the Imperial Federation project. But regarding the, you can almost say, lower status, almost subhuman status of elements of the Irish population and then the impetus towards immigration, not just into the United States, but also into England. Liverpool, say, for example, uh, was able to send one Irish Home Rule NP back to Parliament in the 1870s. Uh, all of these things are interesting points to compare. But with the subversive foreign policy, I'm talking about consistent trends towards the propagation of universalism, liberalism. We see this in the support of the Latin Wars of American independence. Um, and then you have figures such as Thomas Cochrane, um, who is directly responsible, say, for example, to the creation of Chilean independence. We see the Greek War of Independence. First of all, the British are responsible for undermining the Ottoman Empire. Then they are responsible for economically controlling it. Again, you can see a constant theme between political subversion and then economic and commercial control. We see British intervention in the Carlos Wars, basically destroying a monarchical regime and then propping up a weak liberal regime based on that of the British Empire. We see Britain assuming a ambivalent posture towards the 1848 revolutions, which is a complete repudiation of the European settlement established by figures such as Castlereagh, the British Foreign Secretary, in 1815. Um, and we see figures such as Earl Russell and later Gladstone supporting ideas such as the unification of Italy and complete contravention to this, supporting the idea of liberal integration of all these territories, nationalism, and the perpetual of parliamentary forms of government. This is all important to know. And the irony, of course, in supporting Catholic emancipation is that liberals want to entertain this idea of um, promoting religious plurality, if not diversity, yet they don't want to be directly threatened by the, by the foreign structures, supposedly, that can actually inhibit the prevalence of liberal ideology. So Earl Russell, completely happy to support Catholic emancipation. The moment the Catholic Church actually tries to set up an Episcopalian structure, that of bishops in Britain, they attempt to stop it. In the same way that Gladstone is supportive of Catholic emancipation, but the minute we see proclamations of papal infallibility, he and Lord Acton almost become uh, uh, pathologically anti-Catholic, as do many other European politicians at this time. We see Britain attempting to manage the situation in the Americas, albeit that's much more complicated. And in terms of getting us to the Gilded Age, when we're talking about American reconstruction, I've, I mean, I've already mentioned China, so I don't really need to get back to that. Um, of course, this is where we can get to the Gilded Age. So I will defer to you here, Semigog. So, so, so sorry, to, sorry to interrupt here. There is a question I want to ask. And again, I don't want to sound too much like a like a kind of uh, leftist here, but through a left wing lens, when the British Empire talks about universalism, it is merely a mask for a sectional interest, especially as it pertains to foreign policy and the promotion of universalism abroad, right? And I, I, I guess the question I would ask is. How much of that universalism was a mask covering up a real face, which is essentially the sectional interest of a of a of a capricious ruling class? Uh, you know, if, if Ashta Khan was here, that's what she would say. Well, um, well yes, and, and I, I, yeah. I, I would. I would also want to draw a distinction between universalism as promoted abroad, with um, uh, universalism promoted domestically. Because some of those things that you mentioned, in my opinion, uh, should never have been allowed. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, Catholic emancipation, and uh, as well as uh, the emancipation of, um, you know, various rules that allowed foreign, foreign, like uh, Jews, for example, to hold posts in the government and things like that. I think all of those things were just 
catastrophic errors to do at home, but I can see benefits of promoting those things abroad. So anyway, carry on. Uh, well, well, no, that's 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 a very good point because it comes back to the earlier point I, I, I raised about the death of high Toryism, the death of monarchy as a viable institution, yet also the destruction of the Church of England as a overarching ideology for empire. Again, this weird idea that it is an empire against empire. It is simultaneously expanding. It is destroying the ideological, ideological bedrock from which to form a unified strata essentially for the empire. This is one of the reasons I attribute for the English Civil War. And it is another reason as to why the Americans ultimately defected due to the prevalent strand of nonconformism, which again is a legacy of the English Civil War. So all of these elements are consistent. And as a Catholic, I will say absolutely that in terms of undermining the conservative superstructure within England at that time. Catholic emancipation did not lead to some sort of Jacobite restoration, as ridiculous as that sounds. Instead, it was the stepping stone for future religious liberalism, as you ultimately see with uh, Baron Rothschild and the Jews essentially entering parliament. And this um, reaches the extreme position where we have, I, I believe it's Charles Bradlaugh, if memory serves me correct, uh, who is the first atheist to become a member of parliament. This controversy ultimately resolves when instead of swearing an oath on the Bible towards God, in order to enter parliament, one simply means, needs to make an affirmation or declaration of fidelity to some sort of idea. And as of course, when you see the state opening of parliament, this is very clear that this has led to a complete breakdown of any cohesive ideology to unite even this country, let alone the British Empire. But bringing this idea back to the promotion of sectional interests and pitting various groups against each other, the expansion of religion, as contrary as this may sound, was often a pretext for the expansion of both the British Empire and also the French Empire. I've done a stream about Napoleon III where I argue consistent, consistently that Catholicism was a defining expansionary ideology for Napoleon III. Uh, the protection of Catholics is used, along with American intervention, it should be said, for expansion and the dissolution of slave trade in the Barbary states and the creation of French Algeria. This is also the pretext towards expanding France's control into Indochina and even into Mexico, when Mexico is created as the Mexican Empire under Habsburg Maximilian. As for Britain, when we look, say, for example, at the expansion into Egypt, which was incredibly controversial from a liberal point of view and basically split the liberal movement as Gladstone was seen as an arch imperialist who was superseding the supposed arch imperialist, which is Disraeli, that was done for the defense of Christian missionaries. And Christian missionaries in China also represented the uh, represented an opportunity for Britain and her imperial sort of um, uh, counterparts to expand extraterritoriality into these nominally sovereign countries and of course sovereignty as a result has proved to be a nonsense because there is an entire legal superstructure being imposed on these countries which directly supports the propagation of to them subversive ideologies in this case christianity with china this results in disaster with the taiping rebellion and again in terms of the contradictions within british policy the expansion of China to Christian missionary work and opening China up through the Opium Wars is also responsible for the destruction of the parasitic form of government which the British have established, which then means the British have to bring in their own troops alongside the French to put this Taiping Rebellion down, which is where you get people like Chinese Gordon. And this situation is repeated again uh, with the Ottoman Empire, among other states. So just to compound your points, AA, they're all completely valid. But Again, uh, Semyagor getting to the Gilded Age and the point you were going to bring up about uh, facilitating the creation of American naval power. Yeah, well, yes, or supporting um, the development of uh, British naval power and uh, and the rest. It's just, there's a bit to go into here. Um, the first part um, is to set some background. Uh, you know, this guy that I mentioned, Peabody, who J.P. Morgan's father uh, went in with. He made his fortune in the 1840s and subsequently, uh, and really picked up um, speed after uh, the war between the states when there was, uh, you know, he had his, uh, the height of his financial success. He was uh, suggested um, 
uh, as someone who should run for uh, president of the United States. Um, and uh, 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 at any rate, he, he made his fortune prior to this Gilded Age phase in the 40s through the 70s, um, basically taking British money and investing it in um, uh, U.S. states and they uh, often had problems with them defaulting on their debts. And so, uh, and if, if this is from Wikipedia, in the 1840s, the state of Maryland defaulted on its debt and Peabody having marketed about half of Maryland securities to individual investors in Europe became persona non grata around London. The Times of London noted that while Peabody was an American gentleman of the most unblemished character, the Reform Club had uh, blackballed him for being a citizen of a country that reneged on its debts. So basically the uh, quiet behind the scenes club system, which is, which is another kind of, um, which is another kind of secret society, really. Um, they put enormous pressure on him. And so he then in 1845 conspired, uh, with uh, one bearings to push Maryland into resuming payment by setting up a political slush fund to spread propaganda for debt resumption uh, and to elect legislatures who would placate their investors. Um, they uh, pumped uh, huge amounts of money uh, into it. They bribed uh, Daniel Webster, the orator and statesman, to make speeches for debt repayment. And uh, the, the attempts were successful. Uh, Pro-resumption Whigs were elected and London bankers uh, started to receive payments. That's Whigs in the U.S. for those listening. Um, and uh, uh, w w this Barings guy, along with um, Peabody, uh, they repeated the same tactics in Pennsylvania. Um, but oddly enough, remember this is in the 1840s, Florida and Mississippi were the most persistent debtors and uh, they were always um, dropping payments. And as such, they were excluded from Peabody's later philanthropy. So we can see a situation where the Brits have already begun to invest heavily in the U.S. and they've got their American, their pet American, buried buried at Westminster Abbey now, mind you, um, who uh, who is helping them to put the squeeze on these states to resume uh, their payments. So this runs up into the 1870s and so begins to overlap with the period or gets close to uh, overlapping with the period, certainly under the control of J.P. Morgan's father, does uh, overlap with the period when Lord Salisbury's in power. And it's important to look at him because the later Milner group um, basically took up his basic methods. Those methods are summed up in Quigley's book, The Anglo-American Establishment. Uh, and Quigley, by the way, was a Harvard graduate, a professor at Georgetown University, consulted to the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Navy and the Smithsonian and House Select Committee. So we're not talking about some crank. Um, uh, Quigley sums up uh, how uh, the Cecil Block, the Marquess of Salisbury, um, they got how they got things done. He says these methods can be summed up under three headings a triple front penetration into politics, education, and journalism, the recruitment of men of, of ability, in this case, chiefly from all souls at Oxford, and the linking of these men to the Cecil block by matrimonial alliances and by gratitude for titles and positions of power. Uh, also the influencing of public policy by placing members of the Cecil block in positions of power shielded as much as possible from public attention. So we can see how, um, uh, this group in Britain uh, wielded power uh, behind the scenes as well as up front. Um, and uh, Milner, who comes along, he's a, a, a close friend and a confederate of uh, Cecil Rhodes. He picks up these techniques. Now, um, uh, later on, uh, Quigley uh, goes to write, um, Salisbury was now talking about Milner and his later efforts. He's, he writes, Salisbury was fundamentally conservative while Milner was not, where Salisbury sought to build up a block of friends and relatives to exercise the game of politics and to maintain the old England that they all loved. Milner was not really conservative at all. Milner had an idea, the eye he had idea he had obtained from Toynbee and that he also found in Rhodes and all the other members of the group. The idea had two parts, that the extension and integration of the empire and the development of social welfare were essential to the continued existence of the British way of life. By the by, uh, Milner was an avowed socialist. Uh, and that this British way of life was an instrument which unfolded all the best and highest capabilities of mankind. Uh, 
Um, working with this ideology derived from Toynbee and Balliol, Milner used the power and the general strategic methods of the Cecil bloc to build up his own group, but realizing that conditions had changed, he put much greater emphasis on propaganda activities and on ideological uh, unity within the group. These were both made necessary by the extension of political democracy and the rise of economic democracy as a practical uh, political issue. These developments had made it impossible to be satisfied with a group held together by no more than family and social connections. So um, then we jump to how Milner begins to do his due uh, with Rhodes. And you can tell from uh, the various wills that Rhodes drew up, um, uh, and, and it, s s several of which uh, made Lord Rothschild, uh, the trustee of his uh, fortune, uh, in one case, the sole trustee, um, uh, he basically wanted to set up a secret society. You can go to the Rhodes um, uh, scholarship website now, and they'll even mention the conspiracy, acknowledging it. They just say that later he d disavowed that. Now, what he did was he just set up the Rhodes scholarships. And uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the, the Stead and Rhodes... Um, uh, discussed their goals and agreed that uh, if necessary, in order to achieve Anglo-American unity, Britain should join the United States. Now, this would have been in a loose ideological sense um, or in some uh, broader sense because the, later the, the members of the Milner group or Milner's kindergarten or the round table, they're all one group. Um, the Chatham House, they're all one group. They... Um, they, they uh, even talked about at some point uh, Britain itself could become just another uh, dominion. But they, uh, they, 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 they go on to talk about how they're going to do this. And it's through control of the press. It's uh, essentially through, let me see if I can find this one, if I can find it quickly. This all begins to overlap uh, with um, the business of... Uh, of uh, uh, World War One as well, so forgive me, but uh, here they write. He writes Milner and his distaste for party politics and for the parliamentary system, and in his emphasis on administration for social welfare, national unity, and imperial federation, was an early example of what this was being written in 1947. By the way, uh, was an early example of what James Burnham has called the managerial revolution. That is the group of a growth of uh, the gr growth of a group of managers behind the scenes and beyond the control of public opinion, who seek efficiently to obtain what they regard as good for the people. To a considerable extent, this point of view became part of the ideology of the Milner Group, although not of its most articulate members like Lionel Curtis, Curtis who continue to regard democracy as a good in itself. There's more on this, and Curtis will have to get into in the very last days of the empire and his utopianism and his is racial egalitarianism and the rest. But now that we've sort of set that background for how the Cecil block worked, um, how the Milner group worked, how Rhodes planned to do what he was going to do. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that for the U S Rhodes scholars, um, or I mean, for the, for the Rhodes scholars that in, at his death in 1902 Rhodes provided for 52 scholarships per year. And this is to bring the best and the brightest elites. It's kind of like the world economic forum or it's, it, it's exactly the same model. What's strange is that in his will, 52 scholarships per year, 20 of those were to go to countries in the British empire and 32 were to go to the United States. Now, given what Rhodes was about and what Milner was about, it seems a, a very striking thing that the overwhelming majority of the scholarships were going to be going to the United States, which wasn't even a part of the empire. So you've got, you know, 20 from New Zealand or Australia or other dominions, 32 from the USA. Now I'm going to jump over very quickly. Bear with me. I'm almost done. Forgive me. Um, this is a book by Quincy Howe. Um, and I, I thank Rupert uh, August for pointing this book out to me, though I should note that he did not uh, endorse its conclusions. Um, Quincy Ho was a Harvard graduate. Uh, for a time, he was director of the ACLU. Uh, he wrote this in 1938. Uh, he was chief editor of Simon and Schuster. Uh, he uh, was with CBS from 1942 forward. He joined ABC. He was associate professor of journalism at University of Illinois. He moderated the first ever uh, presidential uh, primary debate in 1956. In 1960, he moderated the fourth and final uh, Kennedy Nixon debate. So he's no crank. Uh, 
either, also from New England. He says this book is called England Expects Every American to Do His Duty. And uh, he talks about the uh, English speaking union uh, and that its goals were, according to its prospectus, to draw together uh, in the bond of comradeship uh, the English speaking people of the world to strengthen the friendly relationship between the people of the United States and of the British empire by, you know, disseminating knowledge, inspiring reverence for their common institutions headquartered in London. But there was a separate, uh, branch of it in the United States. This was born in, uh, 1917. But if you look at the people who are, um, it, it, who are involved with this, the first chairman of the English speaking union of the British empire was none other than Lord Balfour. Um, who is explicitly called out by Quigley as a member of that road circle and of the Milner group. Um, and uh, other people were uh, 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 John W. Davis, who succeeded the late Walter Hines Page as American's wartime ambassador in London. Um, and, uh, and, and in 1933, this Davis fellow had become J.P. Morgan's most trusted advisor. Of course, uh, um, Morgan was the sole representative financially of the British government in the United States. Um, and a uh, Morgan partner also held the, uh, uh, holds, uh, at the time of the writing of this, the post of the treasurer of the English speaking union. Uh, there's also, uh, the council on foreign relations, still another organization devoted to America, uh, American foreign policy illustrates still more clearly the pro-British bias of the most well-to-do Americans. The Council on Foreign Relations, which everyone is familiar with, um, on the board of directors, we encounter uh, many of our friends from the English-speaking union, like John Davis again, um, and a number of uh, big names. Notable among them is Walter Lippmann, who is a name that's going to be familiar to uh, everyone. We'll jump over to the New York Times. Um, here, uh, he, he, we have a little, uh, bit about, uh, Adolf S. Ox, who built up the New York times. Um, he did so, uh, acting as an intermediary between the British Admiralty and the American department of state. And in, uh, in, in, in by preparing the way for British inspired, uh, Naval conference at Washington in 1921. Um, and, uh, there's this bit. And this is the last piece I'll give you. There's there's more along these lines, but, but this one is rather telling. Um, it was during Adolf S. Ox, uh, you know, the New York Times guy, um, is his conversations with Lord Lee of the British Admiralty that Mr. Ox defined the policy of his paper in terms that might have surprised those readers who took at face value the Times' slogan, all the news that's fit to print. And this is uh, a report of uh, what Ox said about it, written by someone who uh, was, uh, in fact, um, a cable editor at the New York Times during that period who put this later in a book. And uh, th here's the quote. I told him, this is Ox speaking. I told him, he wrote afterwards, that I had always felt the peace and welfare of the world rested with the English-speaking nations, and particularly with the United States and the British Empire, and that I regarded it as my patriotic duty to promote that as far as lay within my power, that the New York Times was dedicated to that policy, that I never thought it necessary to have treaties or written agreements to that effect, that I thought to express it in writing would simply be qualifying the broader principles of our friendly relations that I thought we were in full accord in our ideas of justice and righteousness, and that while our interpretations of these principles might not at all times be in accord with the understanding of other nations, we should unitedly be strong enough to maintain our ideals, protect them, and win respect for them, if by no other means than by our power and strength. So I've gone on a bit too long, but I wanted to point out that there's a clear trajectory of British investment of financing NGOs, as we would call them today, in order to sway public opinion, precisely as we see Soros doing, precisely as we see Gates doing. And in many respects, Rhodes himself seems to be one of the uh, uh, early representatives of this sort of, you know, captain of industry, wealthy uh, industrialist or mining magnate or whatever, who is doing things like running color uh, revolutions and setting up conspiracies and uh, making arrangements for the elite from around the world to come and be uh, indoctrinated with his, his own views. So this runs uh, across the period in some respect or another from uh, the, the Gilded Age uh, 
uh, all the way through to the uh, the, the beginning of uh, World War One. Thank you for, for that uh, very lengthy and uh, very detailed exposition, Semigog. I, I just want to have a quick message for the audience. I am doing this off memory. I'm not doing this with notes. So I'm going to try and push back against aspects of it. In terms of the proliferation of the financial sector and everything regarding the integration between the American com commercial elites and the British commercial elites, I compound that and also regarding the intricacies of Cecil Rhodes as the caesarean figure building up a coalition which was ultimately not to produce a caesarean effect within Britain. That's also a, a point to really focus on here. I do not believe that Cecil, the Marquis of Salisbury, uh, represents a continuation of these policies. Rather, I think it represents the opposite. I've been emphasizing the centrifugalism of the British Empire, the loss of accountability, uh, the transition from imperial authority to something which is completely deracinated from the interests of definitely the British Isles in terms of becoming something else. But what Salisbury, Salisbury represents a throwback to an earlier age. Salisbury was one of the most vehement opponents of Disraeli and his expansion of the franchise. But ultimately, Salisbury would tentatively adopt various aspects of the Disraeli system, the support of the empire, and actually expanding on that to adopt a policy of supposed splendid isolation, which essentially meant aloofness from the affairs of European power politics, and indeed subversion of other nations, in contrast to this idea of the deeply subversive effects of direct British policy on the Americas. There's also a component to which his dynastic policy, which you're very right in uh, pointing out, is again um, hearkening back to this earlier age in which there was a more consolidated figurehead. And Salisbury, in this sense, represents the elder statesman of the great of the empire. Um, in terms of being able to unite all the various colonies, dominions under a single vision, which is compounded by this idea of splendid isolation. There is an element to which this dynastic nepotistic form of government, of course, is represented in Arthur Balfour. Um, but around this um, network, which is supporting the conservatives and ultimately the unionist movement, is defense of the British Empire, a opposition to Irish home rule, which has come to the forefront of British politics since the 1880s, since the rise of Charles Stuart Parnell and the Gladstonian conversion to home rule, which divides the Liberal Party as with the progressive element. I also want to point out that viewing Milner as a socialist is a bit misguided. He's very much a progressive liberal in the David Lloyd George mold, because if you view socialism at that time in terms of compounding labor policies, especially when it comes to labor foreign policy, that's really complicated. And I don't believe it represents Milner's views. But regarding what the Conservative Party, the Unionist Party represented the turn of the 20th century, it was playing with the ideas of social reform. And this is where obviously AA is very familiar with this. We come to the idea of one nation conservatism. We come to the ideas of Tory democracy. And Randolph Churchill, who was the father of Sir Winston Churchill, uh, was an active pioneer in this. In terms of expanding this movement into becoming a mass movement and allowing for the proliferation of the Conservative Party into essentially a broad middle class and even working class movement. We see the emergence of organizations such as the Primrose League. Um, so there is a conscious attempt, as you mentioned, in terms of expanding the whole conservative network of power beyond this tight nepotistic group, which involves uh, Lord Salisbury and Arthur Balfour. Um, and you can say the inheritor of this movement is Lord Salisbury. The culmination of splendid isolation should have resulted in imperial preference, but ultimately contrary to this idea of Salisburyism as representing dynasticism, Ultimately, democracy and all the effects which these conservative government have attempted to mitigate and control, as you brought up, uh, were thrown back in the face of the conservative government when Arthur Balfour could not unite these various forces into pre uh, presenting a viable solution to the issues facing empire, especially after the Boer War. The conservative party split and then the liberals who were jumping on the bandwagon of social reform after the Boer War, uh, completely eviscerated the Conservative government, but interestingly, not for the cause of progressivism, but for the cause of maintenance of the free trade. Um, 
it, it, there's also a general point I want to bring regarding bringing up things like Milner's Kindergarten and the uh, the round table organizations is that prevalent among all of these groups is a incredibly pluralistic, diverse diffusion of ideas, contradictory ideas, which is prevalent throughout the 1920s and the 1930s in terms of not just relationship to America, relationship to the Soviet Union, relationships within the colonies, the role of the dominions, the British Empire. There is such a disparity within the views that this actually accounts for what I believe to be after Salisbury, the collapse of a central authority in the British Empire, the collapse of a leading visionary who can allow for the British Empire to undergo this process of coalescing into an empire proper. And Winston Churchill is not that figure. He is the antithesis of that figure. So just to push back on just aspects of to, to augment some and to just mitigate some others. But AA has been very patient and has been waiting to speak. So please, AA, chime in. Well, I mean, uh, I guess the problem I've always had with all of this sort of stuff, the, the Quigley stuff and uh you know Sutton and all this sort of thing you know i mean i have a i have uh, all of quigley's books here and one of the things i've always fixated on is the quotation on the back which is by a certain bill clinton and i i, of, I often wonder like what is what is actually going on here uh why is this stuff so like why is quigley so mainstream and venerated by clinton and so on and my sense now i'm not like I'm not kind of passing moral judgment on what Cecil Rhodes was up to and what J.P. Morgan was trying to do. But I have always seen these figures, likes of Carnegie, Morgan, uh, Rhodes, as basically Faustian great men who were trying to achieve great things in a grand old uh, European Anglo tradition of, you know, these were just titanic figures who were, you know, men who had will to power and all the rest of it, which is just part of the, you know, the story of the quote unquote West. Um, and what I fear may be happening and what, why some of these books are so mainstream is because I, I mean, straightforwardly, I believe there, there was a circulation of elites in America uh, in the 20th century from the period of Wilson to the period of about uh, of, of LBJ I believe that there was a, you know, the, the broadly speaking, the old Wasp establishment was replaced with, um, you know, the Ellis Island Coalition, and that these sorts of stories about the the elites of that earlier period uh, were, were basically a convenient way of that new elite coalition, um, you know, essentially of, uh, you know, Irish, Italian Americans. Um, uh, 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 and, and Jews, uh, I mean, let's face it, that's that's who it was, um, of basically kind of casting and casting shade on the previous era, the previous elites, because that's what all that's what all new elites do, basically. They cast shade on old elites. So, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I guess the questions I would ask of is, okay, all right, clandestine activity and will to power and all the rest of it, but, I mean, are we really saying that Cecil Rhodes and J.P. Morgan and Carnegie and these people didn't have like any sort of positive effect on the places that they were investing in at all? I mean, these people built empires. They created thousands of jobs. They, they, were, they weren't a net positive overall for America or for, uh, you know, in Cecil Rhodes' case, uh, you know, for Africa. No, I, I, certainly, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, by the, but by the same yardstick, you could say that Soros and Gates are just, you know, Titans as a part of the story of the West. What, what the, the, the relevance of these observations in my view, I, I uh, mean, uh, sorry, sorry, Sammy, go, I, I would, I mean, in the way I would look at it, <laughs> I would actually draw a distinction between Gates and Soros, but uh, maybe, AM doesn't want to go into that, but anyway, carry on, carry on. Well, the the main point being that there is a clear trajectory. It's documented, uh, and and it shows that there were people who wished explicitly to rope the United States in, 
And um, we can see with the Chamberlain quote, you know, I mentioned before about the weary Titan staggering that Britain was in a situation where it needed to find a solution to its circumstances. And many of the people who were involved in thinking about potential solutions were perfectly willing to countenance if Could it were I, necessary. But because you brought this point earlier and you, you've expanded upon it greatly, but um, I, I just want to, again, try to offer some context regarding this. This wasn't explicit British policy throughout the early 20th century, and there were also American actors who were willing to go along with this. The most prominent example, of course, is Edward House. And the paranoia surrounding Edward House was the creation of the Japanese-British alliance, the idea that the British would rule the Atlantic and the Japanese would rule the Pacific. The fruits of this alliance had resulted in the decimation of Russia's position in Asia, and I've talked about this at length in a stream called Russia's Greatest Defeat, because I do believe this puts pay to the idea of Asian expansion. And you can say that this is one of Britain's greatest triumphs, defeating Russia in the great game by use of a proxy in Japan. And so the great sort of transition in British foreign policy after World War I is conducting a Anglo-American naval treaty, which causes the breach in the relations with Japan. And I would argue ultimately facilitates the demise of the British Empire in Asia and allowing America to economically penetrate this area. There is no way in which this supported British politics. And I do believe actually you're right in the sense that this is an extension of the American Americanism implicit in figures like Milner, who actually rose to political prominence in the 19 in the 1920s rather than the earlier period, as opposed to where he's representing the um ideological coalescence of the ideas of Imperial Federation. But regarding World War I specifically, there is a fundamental breach here. By 1916, it is clear that there is a large peace camp arising within the British government led by Asquith. The policy of Wilson was not to bring the United States necessarily into war, even though there were many factions lobbying for that, but to create a peace without victors, a peace without annexations. And this would have compounded the sentiment under Herbert Asquith. What fundamentally changes this, as you're no doubt aware, is the coup of David Lloyd George in the latter part of um, 1916. And this creates a cascade of effects which precipitates the uh, German declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare, um, which slowly provides the impetus of the Americans to contrive things such as the Zimmerman tem at the telegraph to allow for some sort of justification to get involved in the conflict. I, I completely agree with you there. But it should be noted that the British policy of the Prime Minister up until 1916 was the promotion of peace and accepting the United States as a neutral arbiter in the conflict in order to create a peace without annexations, moving away from this idea of total war. And you brought up regarding the Balfour Declaration, which is very interesting, involving figures such as Montague. I also think it's important to push back on this idea about the prevalence of Balfour. Balfour was nothing more at this point than a political concession to the Conservative Party. He was an incredibly weak leader of the Conservative Party who I believe doomed the viability of the dynasticism of um, uh, the Earl of Salisbury, sorry, the Marquis of Salisbury, and the creation of imperial preference due to his fundamental lack of leadership and the fact that Joseph Chamberlain did not have a strong enough coalition in which to oust the remnants of what is now essentially a corrupted form of the Marquis of Salisbury's coalition. And by the time of First World War, he's basically an ostracized figure. No one really pays any attention to him. The strong figure within the Conservative Party is, in fact, Andrew Berner Law, who represents, you can say, the lingering aspects of Chamberlainism within the Conservative government. And we see various concessions nominally made under the aegis of Balfour, such as the creation of a Jewish home state following the successes of British expansionism vis a vis the Ottoman Empire. So you're right in saying that after. The fundamental breach in 1916. There is a deliberate shift in British policy fomented by all of these negative actors and driven by the hysteria of Edward House about the US ultimately becoming eclipsed by the burgeoning alliance between Japan and the United States. So in addition to financial reasons, in addition to, you can say, Jewish sectarian interests, there is also a major foreign policy geostrategic reason, which is to confound this alliance. And ultimately, the Americans are very successful, despite their isolationism in the 1920s. This is one of their greatest coups. But anyway, continue.
Well, but, but in terms of, well, first off, something that I didn't get to uh, correct earlier, when, when I mentioned Salisbury earlier, I, 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 as indeed Quigley lays it out, the point is that Milner learned certain techniques from Salisbury and then carried them further and did new things with them, um, which is to say that, um, you know, that, that, and also he got his first boost um, in terms, you know, he was, he was not a wealthy man by the standard. Uh, oh, no, I, I, I agree. I agree with you completely. And if you look at figures like David Lloyd George, if you look at figures like Milner, who represent that period of um, uh, progressive imperialistic ascendancy from 1917 up until 1922, they are all demonstra demonstrative of this. They in many ways represent the worst aspects of the conservative movement. Um, and they are the successors of that legacy. David Lloyd George, despite being a liberal, was in power as a result of the national coalition ticket which decimated the power of the liberal party so i completely echo those sentiments i don't want to seem as if i'm contradicting you there certainly um and and, and um and just one other thing this is from uh 17th of december 1906 uh milner speaking at wolverhampton he says not only am i an imperialist of the deepest dye and imperialism you know is out of fashion but i actually believe in universal military training he mentions some other things. He says he's a tariff reformer and uh, one of a, a somewhat pronounced type. But he says, I am unable to join in the hue and cry against socialism, that there is an odious form of socialism, I admit, a socialism which attacks wealth simply because it is wealth and lives on the cultivation of class hatred. But that is not the whole story, most assuredly not. There is a nobler socialism which so far from springing from envy, hatred, and uncharitableness is born of genuine sympathy and a lofty and wise conception is what is meant by national life. Um, so uh, I don't mean that he's necessarily a socialist in the, the most strict sense. And I certainly agree with you about the mix of different ideas as people, frankly, behind the scenes, were just trying to get get people to go with their basic programs. And so in many respects, I think they, they would say uh, whatever uh, suited them. As for um, Balfour being a, a, a figure of no importance, I would, I would say, well, he was certainly important in uh, bringing um, the United States into World War I. As best I can tell, uh, Germany uh, under the Kaiser had plans to set up a homeland for the Jews uh, in the East. Uh, living in Turkey, I uh, learned uh, quite a bit about the um, the former uh, uh, intelligence relationships of Germany with the Turks. Um, we know uh, about that with uh, World War One. So the idea that the Kaiser was going to help set up a Jewish homeland uh, seems entirely plausible on its face. They were close allies of the Germans and had a deep penetration politically and uh, in terms of intelligence services into uh, the Ottoman Empire and so would have been in a position to uh, do that for the Jews. And as many as one million Jews signed up to fight in the Kaiser's armies. So there was a real problem in the United States. All the the, the wealth and pressure that had been placed um by the Brits on the American establishment to bring them in was not yielding the results that were desired. You there, there is there is a fundamental transition here, which which needs to be expounded because this may be confusing for people who see a continuity between war aims against Germany in 1914 and war aims against Germany in 1939, because Jews by and large were supportive of the Kaiserreich in 1914. And this is because Germany was a war against Russia. The Jews had suffered in the pogroms in Russia and the memory of Kishinev had been Chisnau, now in modern day Moldova, had been sufficient to bring a huge amount of American financial backing to support the Japanese in basically crushing the Russian crusade into Manchuria. This is really significant. And as you mentioned, the Kaiser was able to lobby the Ottoman Empire due to that alliance to be in a position to essentially enable this. What fundamentally changes the political picture is the military success of the British Empire in the situation in Palestine, um, whereby the Ottomans are no longer in that position to offer that sort of condition, and also the Russian Revolution. Once the Russian Revolution, the March Revolution occurs, which precedes the American entry into the war by one month, 
all of a sudden the notion of oppressive czarism versus the Jewish population is no longer a serious consideration for America's Jews to decide to back the British cause. So just again, some context there. But uh, again, I, I want to pass this over to AA now because this is important just regarding, yeah. The, yep. the last piece though, is that Balfour comes along and along with that context you provide, he makes the declaration to Rothschild, as we all know. And it's at that point, um, I mean, Balfour's declaration comes after he was sure that everybody had gone in all in on the deal. But the or, or original discussions between Sykes and um, uh, Chaim Weitzman, or whatever his damn name was, uh, took place several months before the U.S. entry into the war. So that Balfour, I'm not saying that he was necessarily an important political figure in Britain at the time. What I'm saying is, and he was a member of the inner Milner circle, he stepped forward and said, uh, we'll give it to you. And you can see from the circumstances uh, on the ground in the war that we're the ones who are going to be in a, a position to give it to you. And so the hesitancy on the part of the Jews uh, in the United States to get behind this, and they're the ones who could pull the lever on the newspapers and the radio broadcasts or newspapers at this point, sorry. Um, the, all of that hesitancy was uh, removed. And so the United States came rolling on in uh, uh, based again on uh, on British pressure. And it should be noted as well that um, Alistair Crowley was rolling around New York, um, working together with the private intelligence services of Morgan um, in order to bring Britain into the war and played a role in passing on uh, false intelligence about we weapons being on the Lusitania in order to get the Germans to uh, to sink the ship and bring the U.S. into the war. I'm just trying to make the point that uh, Balfour and British interests and likely uh, Milner Circle interests were involved in bringing uh, the U.S. into the war. And the whole point, peace or not, with Asquith is that they wanted total victory so that they could impose their new vision for uniting all under heaven with the League of Nations and all the rest which is a pattern that the United States repeated after World War uh, II, uh, just coming up with a new version of it, following the same basic program, just calling it the uh, the United Nations. I'll also note that Hitler attempted in 33, I think it was, with the Havre Agreement to again bring the Jews online, and he agreed to help them um, relocate to the Holy Land. Uh, and I, I guess what happened is that uh, in the 40s, the U.S. said, look, you know, I know Balfour promised you that you were going to get a homeland and you really didn't. And you've we've got problems with with uh, Jewish settlers and Palestinians and the rest. But we, the United States, are finally going to be in a position to really give it to you. So, um, you know, put your uh, money and wealth behind uh, us and uh, and we'll have an allegiance here and we'll finally make it happen, which is indeed well, what we've seen go down. I'm just saying that there's continuity between the programs of the British uh, elite and the US elite, uh, it, it, at least certain factions of them. Everything I'm trying to do here is simply to underscore that we see the same plan and program being carried forward by elites on both sides. No, I... I really just want to confirm this. I don't agree. I don't uh, disagree with you about many of those points. It's simply a matter of taking those plans, those best laid plans, and again, disparate solutions within those policy makers and saying that this represents official policy. That's my contention because official policy was evolving and in many ways contradictory. But this is Regu the last, last point, and I will, I will be silent. I won't talk again during the thing, and I apologize to AA official policy, the whole point about it not really being an empire and and things going on behind the scenes and free reign for oligarchs, the whole point of this is that in, in their clubs, the, the official policy was just putting the cherry on top of the, the cake that had already been baked by behind the scenes machinations. So I'm not sure to what extent official policy even matters. In the United States, the official policy is that they're not supposed to port, uh, support any country with nuclear weapons that isn't party to the non-proliferation treaty. And Israel has admitted they have nuclear weapons and they ignore official policy. So apo ap apologies. Well, this isn't inconsistent at all with my idea of centrifugalism pertaining to the British Empire. Um, 
and that doesn't mean we should ignore official policy. We should contextualize it within the points that you bring up. I don't, I'm not, I don't, not seeing a contradiction here. And regarding Alpha Balfour, my contention is not to see him as a relevance. My contention is to see him as politically inept and incompetent, but he is one of the most connected British politicians all the way since the 1880s. And in the capacity of foreign secretary, it simply compounds those connections. What I'm saying is that within the actual centralized policymaking apparatus of the war, he was excluded. He wasn't part of the war committee. But AA, because you have been so patient, I want to bring you to this point where we also bring back to Milner and you can say his sentiments towards socialism, which is Milner's role in conscription. More broadly, AA, why do you think conscription came about and how do you think that conscription fundamentally transformed the nature of the British Empire? Well, I mean, just before we just before we get to that, I feel like there's a cast of characters who've been left out of this story for some reason um, it, it, in the American context of World War I. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of focus on like people like J.P. Morgan and Milner and so on. But what about, uh, you know, like Bernard Baruch, Paul Wahlberg, Eugene Mayer? Because, the, the, I mean, the actual effect of America entering World War I was that essentially Wood, Woodrow Wilson turned over the government to these men. I mean, Bernard, Bernard Baruch was probably one of the most powerful individuals ever to exist. And during the, the war economy of World War I, I mean, you know, Henry Ford described him as, a, as basically the dictator of the USA. He, he, he had direct control over the entire war economy. He could literally, you know, uh, allocate resources with the flick of a pen. Like the entire U.S. economy was un, like in, under his direct control. So, I, I do. I mean, you know, if we want to talk about financial elites, I just, I, I just don't understand why the focus is so much on likes of J.P. Morgan and so on. Because well, I mentioned at the it, outset that that Rothschild was the executor of Rhodes's will, and that yeah. the the I, I mean, and it should be evident to everyone that the model for close cooperation with Jewish financial interests in order to prosecute imperial aims didn't come mm -hmm. from the United States. But I mean, these, I mean, these characters were pretty keen on World War One. is what I'm saying on the American oh, I, side. I, I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I just wanted to mention them. Uh, uh, just to put, yeah. just a point before yeah. AA can continue. I, I just want yeah. to say that we've got a lot to get through. <laughs> um, so, so if we could speed this up and get to the 1930s, but before the critical differentiation in terms of a split between the British Empire that came before and the British Empire that comes after is the issue over conscription. So please, AA. Well, I mean, from my, from just to keep it really brief, I would say that. After World War One, um, it was basically not tenable to give, not to give the people who had been conscripted and drafted political rights. After that point, they needed more of a political voice, and the um, the labor movement, it was called, and labor as a party, is a uh, you know uh, intimately connected. I would say at the rise of the Labour Party is intimately connected the political effect of essentially dragooning millions of men to go into the trenches. Um, so, I mean, that, that would, that's my kind of York notes, quick version of what I think cons conscription does, because after that point, uh, essentially the government um, has to be seen to "Quote unquote," take care <laughs> uh, of, of of these men who, you know, they sent to die in their millions. Um, that would be my quick take on it. Would you agree with that? Well, it, well, it's interesting because th there are a lot of ways you can view this in terms of the broad scope of the British Empire. Uh, sorry, just a few years before AA, the Conservative government had challenged the idea of liberals conscripting forces to forcefully implement Irish Home Rule, which had become policy because of the coalition that Irish Home Rulers have propped up the Liberal government since 1910. The Conservatives argued this on the case that Britain historically did not have a standing army, 
the exception, of course, being Cromwell. But when Charles II comes into power, this whole notion is disbanded and Britain returns essentially to not possessing a standing army. This in a fundamental contrast to the nations of Europe and this in terms of representing the exceptionalism that is the British Empire. So conscription represents a fundamental breach in terms of that relationship, Britain becoming a land power while at the same time Britain's resources and Britain's hold on its colonies is at the same time diminishing. But just to illustrate your point in terms of the social effects, it's not just the social effects in terms of the men who are being brought back and expect to have some sort of purchase in the society, which has essentially betrayed them over forcing them to fight a World War One for nothing, but it's also the effect of women entering the workforce, the diminution of the family, the idea of women being given voting rights for the first time in 1918, which will be extended in 1928 to essentially allow for the parliamentary system of government to become closely resembling a democracy. And as Semiagog, yourself and I know, democracy does not mean rule of the people. It means the expansion of statism, and you can say a more diffuse um, selection of power brokers who are less accountable in terms of being able to drive policy. Um, I really just want to get on, to, again, just for the sake of brevity, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to either of you, AA, you have brought up in two streams on your channel. Everyone, please check out Academic Agents channel and um, look into these streams. Regarding Britain's policy in the 1930s and the causes of World War II. So please, could you um, just expound a little bit on that topic? Um, I mean, well, it's a big, it's a big topic. Uh, um, I don't really know. Uh, I mean... There's a lot. There's a lot going on in this period in general. I would say, um, including, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the topic of the of this stream, decline of the British Empire. Um, what I would say are quasi openly subversive elements in the British establishment by this point that were actively looking as early as the 1920s to give away and to ferment nationalist movements in various places, um, most notably in India. You know, I have in mind um, E. Samuel Montague uh, uh, as, as, as one example, or Ed Edwin Montague. Um, uh, he was the Secretary of State for India, and there was a report, I don't know if you've read this, the Montague Chelmsford Report, um that was filed that basically highlighted that the number of indians who really asked for free institutions does not exceed five percent of the population but we are not setting about to stir 95 percent of the population out of their peaceful conservatism so so basically they were complaining in this report that the indians were kind of happy living under, <laughs> living under the empire and there was no like so like, why was the Secretary of State for India trying to ferment a nationalist movement in 1924? As an official, I mean, that was an official report filed to Parliament. And there's many, many, many other cases like that um, where you can see, um, despite the official policy being being one thing, you know, uh, promising to maintain the empire and so on, actually, you've got elements within the establishment, liberal ones burgeoning left-wing ones, um, basically looking to get a lot of territories off the books for one reason or another, uh, as early as the 1920s. Um, so that was one thing that was going on. Um, and then I don't know at what point uh, AM we should, I mean, you know, there's there's a, in my view, a supervillain <laughs> uh, lurking uh, at this point in history. Uh, in and around the British elite, called Sir Winston Churchill, the the cover star of this episode, and uh, I mean, I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, the story of what happens is Ill intimately bound up with the activities of this one man, in my opinion, um, who I hold, uh, you know, not he is one of the primary reasons for Britain getting itself involved in World War Two. He is one of the primary reasons for the awful political outcomes for Britain uh, of 
uh, World War II, including land lease, including, um, you know, essentially uh, handing over, uh, you know, world power, uh, global power status to uh, America. And then in the in the post-war period, um, I mean, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but in the post-war period, he is also a supervillain because he, he becomes <laughs> prime minister again in 1951. And uh, I mean, I have a book here called Im uh, Imperial Obituary by Major General Richard Hilton. And I'll just read this uh, one tiny passage. Um, so the conservatives, right, um, took power back from Labour. Uh, you know, Clement Attlee uh, was the prime minister between 1945 and 1951. And it was actually under him, left-wing socialist government, where they just kind of gave away an absolute shit ton of territory, India, Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, Myanmar, Ceylon, uh, you know, all of those uh, given away basically by the Atli government um, for re mysterious reasons. Um, and then Hilton says, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, but apart from these scuttles, the British Empire still remained, being when the Conservative Party commenced its 13 years of power in 1951. During those 13 years of government by this right-wing party, whose declared policy till then had always included the maintenance of the British Empire, the entire empire was disintegrated. Does that remind you of anything? 13, 13 years of an abject Tory government <laughs> who do the exact opposite of what they promised to do. Um, I mean, the, the I mean, he, he that chapter is called the process of betrayal, but the number of the number of actions in this period from, you know, the interwar period right up and in, right up into the 1950s. If I was to describe the actions of the British elite as anything, it would just be traitorous. They're just it is just outright treason. As far as I can see, none of their actions make any sense whatsoever. Um, from the point of view of British prestige, British power, British interest. I mean, it's just a nonsense. All of these what about from awful. the perspective of finances? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Semigog, I, I don't see, uh, again, I, I, I hate to bring this point up, but regarding central authority and imperial figurehead and the centrifugalism and the, you can say the timing of the British Empire in the sense that it was doomed due to the entire construct of which it was built, um, the foundations of which it was built. R regarding finance, if a, say for example, the Jews wanted Britain to stand up to Hitler, and of course there is a major component to that driving British policy, Churchill's own policy and US policy towards this, British policy in the 1930s makes no sense, if you take that in the perspective. It is wholly un incompetent and inconsistent, not just in the case of um, uh, the relationship to Germany, but the whole policy of appeasement in general. And I, I like the fact, A, you brought up the uh, Montague Chelmsford report. Um, it's the creation of diarchy, which is the idea of Indian responsible government. And this is actually compounded by the Simon report. The whole premise of the diarchy is that the government will continually review the situation in India. Essentially, there is a basis for increased progressivism in the state of India. And the Simon Report actually provides the entire ideological and political bedrock for Indian independence 12 years later, which is rapidly increase as a result of the process of the Second World War. So that really needs to be illustrated. The mobilization of the Indian National Congress, the Indian National Congress that needs to be pointed out was a essentially a, a British adventure from the begin from the beginning. It was founded by a British, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it, Indianophile. Um, and of course it became a Anglicized liberal Indian elite movement from there. And the franchise, as you mentioned, AA was very small. And of course, this was actually in stark contrast to the entire Indian alliance system, which you can see on this map, which was predicated around the British allying with Indian aristocratic elites, the so-called Raja states. So that's very important to bring up in terms of the British, not only creating a situation in which 
the Indian Empire would secede, but creating a situation in like the doctrine of lapse that precedes the Sepoy Rebellion or the Indian Mutiny of 1858, the British have created a situation in which they are going to betray their very allies who have helped propped up the Raj. <laughs> so just to, to, to really compound all the points you bring there. And of course, the effect of the First World War, uh, Semiagog, in terms of all the investment and the financial motivations and the British spies, all this is simply to compound that it was completely in vain in terms of the perpetuation of the British Empire and in service of something else, which is very clear here, because the British Empire, as a result of World War One, rather than consolidating, rather than universal conscription being seen as a tool for imperial unification, is a tool of imperial disintegration. And the case, obviously, with Anzac nationalism, the, the memory of Gallipoli in terms of the national story, you can almost say the first national story of Australia, and of course, what we see in the creation of India. But in terms of coming back to 1930s and the idea of the British elite being almost seen as outright traitorous, which I agree with you. And this also actually pertains to the U uh, UK policy towards the Soviet Union, which has been created this time. Lloyd George accelerates the process of recognition of the Soviet Union. Um, they are allowed in under the Labour government. You have aspects such as the Zinoviev letter, which uh, sub subsequently have been denounced supposedly as fake, but there is definitely a pro-Soviet contingent in that government. And of course, the Soviets bring over spies and the Conservative the government under Stanley Baldwin and expels them all again. But regarding the policy of the 1930s, the British did everything in their power to alienate their natural allies. They alienated the Japanese over their League of Nations stance over Manchuria. And again, as I mentioned before, the Manchurian question had been the motivation for attacking Russia in the first place and allowing Britain to defeat Russia by proxy. Now Britain has betrayed Japan twice over the Anglo-American Naval Treaty and over the issue of Manchuria. And again, the fundamental contradiction which puts a time limit on the success of the British Empire is the fact that the League of Nations is essentially proposing the idea of self-determination. Chinese are allowed self-determination, Manchurians are allowed self-determination vis-a-vis Japanese expansion, but no one else in the British Empire is. So this again, in terms of a fundamental contradiction, appears like a farce. In terms of Mussolini and his alienation from the British Alliance project, we see the annexation of Abyssinia. The Abyssinian war is basically a litmus test for Britain's ability to countenance a imperial aggressor because of course, Italy had tried to invade Ethiopia in the 1890s, had been humiliated, they succeed in the 1930s. But what Britain does is drive Italy away from their own sphere of influence and into the camp of the Germans. Italy, just for a bit of context at this time, had been responsible partly for renting German access to Austria and completing the process of Anschluss. Really, you can say that Mussolini's direct turn in 1938, as with the Japanese turn towards invading the Chinese in 1937, is all a result of British incompetence. And regarding appeasement, Churchill, you can say, actually, to give him a bit of slack, if Britain was going to go to war against Germany in 1939, Churchill, as we saw in 1914, was a consistent war hawk against Germany to the point of madness in terms of the mitigation, the defeat of so-called Prussian militarism, which is a consistent theme in, in Churchill's mind, uh, his worldview. Regarding appeasement, it seems completely contrary to British interests if the ultimate design of the American empire, of the United States to get involved in a conflict, uh, is to go to war against Germany in 1939, after having allowed Hitler to consolidate um, both the army and both his uh, economic position and his territorial position, where basically Poland could be wiped out from both sides as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, Another point to consider, which is lost in terms of the whole concept of appeasement, is the complete apathy of the British Empire in terms of defending its own interests, where really the whole notion of a British Empire, which is self-interested, again, coming back AA to this idea of, tre of treason, is that the British Empire accepts a process of decline. We see this first in China, where the British are conceding their various territorial concessions, where Britain is taking a back seat regarding their economic full spectrum control in the 1890s as per the Imperial Maritime Customs Service. And in Ireland, this is the most extreme process, and I would say a foreshadowing of the dissolution of the Dominion. Because first of all, in 1922, Ireland was created as the Irish Free State. We have the war in Ireland. This 
completely confounds the idea of unionism, which is now limited to what is now Northern Ireland. In the 1930s, Eamon de Valera came back into power through his new outfit, Fianna Foyle, which replaced in part Sinn Féin, albeit Sinn Féin continued. And he began a deliberate process towards the creation of an Irish Republic. The British did virtually nothing to stop it. And by the 1930s, Ireland was essentially independent in all but name. The king only had a tangential link. And during World War II, this was confirmed by strict Irish neutrality. After World War II, Canada begins opting for independence from 1946. In terms of that portrayal, AA, that you mentioned regarding the 13 years under a Conservative government, under Churchill, under Eden, under Macmillan, where is the Winds of Change speech delivered? In Cape Town? I, yeah. In, in a complete sort of um, contravention of the then ruling elite who were up until that point aligned with the British Empire. So not only do they basically opt out of the Commonwealth project at that point, but they also disband their connection to the monarchy and proclaim themselves a republic in full repudiation of the winds of change. So as we see with India and as we see with the Boers, it seems that British policy after World War I is a deliberate alienation of their allies. One of the most bizarre things about this, as told by Major General Richard Hilton, who was a kind of, you know, hardcore imperial loyalist, you know, British Empire, kind of a almost you could say Colonel Blimp character if you want. Um, he he is just completely befuddled by, I mean, in today's terms, but, I mean, and the list is huge, by the way, you know, India, Pakistan, Myanmar, Ceylon, Ghana, Malaya, British Somaliland, Cyprus, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, South Africa, South Cameroons, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, you know, Zanzibar, Malaysia, Kenya, Malta, I mean, it's just insane. Rhodesia, all of these places uh, during during this time. But the way he describes it, I think in today's terms, it's almost like a kind of series of colour revolutions supported by left-wing intellectuals in England, even in places where they didn't particularly want it. And I mean, there, there are a few cases where it was violent. But as as Hilton points out, it's like, the British army could have smashed any of those places if they'd wanted to during that time. It's not like, you know, Britain didn't have a, an army and couldn't, I mean, you know, they just refused to put them down because they had this idea in Hilton's terms. He says, majority rule has been elevated by left-wing propaganda to the status of a sacred religious fetish to which even such an eminent Christian divine as the Archbishop of Canterbury bows down. Um, and what, what does that what does that remind you of? Yeah, I mean, and what his, his what his point is is that in all of these places, like there was no particular will on the part of the pub of the publics of these countries or the subjects of these countries to want independence or like, there was no like popular support for any of these things. It was merely just kind of exactly like you see color revolutions in countries now, uh, you know, pushed by the pushed by the uh, what we call the gay. But the most bizarre thing is, is that these are, you know, countries declaring independence, becoming nations in their own right and, you know, uh, you know, leaving the British Empire. Aided and abetted by British elites. It's, it's really one of the most bizarre things. Um, that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what accounts for it, to be honest. I, I still don't know what why that happened. Regarding, why, why, yeah. regarding Africa, I can point to several things. The African cause of independence is precipitated by Suez. The idea that the Americans are no longer going to back up the continuity of British control. In terms of the British willingness to put down these rebellions, there is also the growing sensation that as per 1848 and the transition of the British subject to the British citizen, that as we see with Jamaica, 
there is a growing fear of immigration, which will result from the integration of these colonies. We see the same with Portugal, which is my view as to why the Carnation Revolution happened, not just for reasons of American-backed left-wing cultural revolution, but the fact that Portugal was rebelling about this idea of the integration of the empire with its African colonies. That's just a point to consider. And you're completely right in terms of the British essentially setting up these intellectual elites with no ultimate gra grassroots support for democracy. This is quote unquote democracy being opposed to above. The most obvious example is Kwane Nkrumah in Ghana, which was the first experiment of this. And of course, we know how well that went. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who was, of course was a leftist, uh, Pan-African, I believe American educated as well. Um, all of these facets, which are completely antithetical towards the preservation of an English empire or a British empire in Africa. Um, and of course, this also accelerates the fact that because Britain is essentially an empire of commerce, and as you know, AA, because you've done several streams on this, the idea of um, the British empire has sometimes been uh, cash flow negative, um, and the idea that the British empire was costing more um, than it was ultimately bringing in. Africa is a prime example of this intensive military control would have essentially meant more resources. And in the long term, given the rise of Americanism, self-determination and democracy, any integration with the African colonies into Britain would create essentially the situation we have now, albeit we don't even have the benefit of having those African colonies. The situation is slightly different when we get to India. As I've mentioned, and as you've alluded to, AA, with the Montague Chelmsford report, the British had done everything in their power to establish the means of Indian independence. The British had also relied increasingly on the vast Indian British army in terms of contributing to the war and in particular contributing to the war against Japan. Japan for the first time actually presenting a major Asian force which could rile up the Indians and towards independence. Um, then you have aspects like the Bengal famine. I should go on record and say if the Bengal famine is a necessary sort of narrative to prop up the Indian state of victimhood, the exact same thing happened in China and Henan with the same number of casualties. Of course, that's not, never mentioned. And the principal causes of the famine are essentially extreme conditions and lack of resources being brought on by the British war effort. And the fact that as in China, as in India, famines were basically endemic to this period, as were cholera outbreaks. I find it very strange, other than the fact that it happened at the time it did, just before independence, that Indian nationalists tend to latch on to the specific cause. But because of the aforementioned reasons, by 1946, the Indian independence movement had become militant to the point, as with Pakistani nationalism under Ali Jinnah and um, his day of action, him trying to lobby for a Muslim uh, nation against the rights of India. Had the British stayed in India for much longer, there would have been the serious instance of Britain essentially having to hold these groups apart from killing each other. And if you look at Mountbatten's policies in India, they are very consistent with this idea of eliminating British culpability for violence. So for example, the process of Indian independence is sped up by a year. And again, it also helps that he's basically pro-labor aligned as in he's ideologically consistent with the idea of Indian independence. Then there is this idea that the territories of Pakistan and India are not going to be demarcated until the day after independence. Thereby, there isn't going to be, the, of course there was, but there isn't going to be wholesale ethnic cleansing before in order to allow the populations to correlate essentially with those territories. So essentially Britain was getting out to avoid a situation that we see in 1948, which is wholesale slaughter involving the deaths of millions, if not tens of millions of people. Um, but in terms of geo, geo, um, geopolitics AA, you're completely right in terms of this confounding Britain's position because Pakistan, of course, remains an American ally but Pakistan is not supported by the British in the case of partition. Um, Pakistan comes out of it incredibly weak compared to essentially what Pakistan could be. And where does Nehru and India ultimately orient towards? The Soviet Union. So again, as is the case with Kwani Nkrumah, as is the case with so many of the African despots which arise out of the situation of allowing the African populations to have one vote once, which simply installs the Western educated elites who had 
been placed into that position essentially through foreign acquiescence and British treason. <laughs> Just to give you a bit of context regarding the uh, the precipitation of the demise of the British Empire, but that's not to say the British Empire didn't try to put down rebellions. So, for example, in Malaya, the Malayan emergency was actually the pretext for sustaining national service up until the end of the 1950s. World War I was fought on the basis of creating universal conscription. So the last dying days of the British Empire will be held together through the maintenance of national service after the effects of the war. And as with the dissolution of the British Empire, we see the end of national service in terms of the British Empire towards its end, representing the antithesis of everything it was at the beginning. Sorry, I, I've been on a long tangent there, but thematically, this is all quite interesting and consistent. I, I think, sorry, I've confounded everyone. Um, I think in terms of building this up, AA, as you can probably see, Churchill, of course, is the um, thumbnail for the stream. This is a copy of the Graham Sutherland painting, which was destroyed by Lady Churchill, because as you can see, it's not exactly very flattering. I mean, Churchill described it as, you know, a great example of modern art, which of course was intentionally belittling it but of course he looks like he's sitting down on the loo it's in no way sort of flattering and he also seems to be clasping on to his position to put this in context I, this was for his 80th birthday and he was still in power and what this painting reminds me of actually is francis bacon's uh study on Velasquez, uh, which is essentially a horror painting of the screaming Pope um, immersed mm -hmm. in a, a sea of purple. And in terms of representing the horror of the end of the British Empire, and I would say the treason, which is encapsulated in the figure of Churchill, I for some reason find that a very apt image. But also in terms of the presentation of Churchill you see in this painting, I mean, I, weirdly, I think Sutherland's portrayal is very accurate in a sense, that we see a a man who is prepared to exalt his own legacy, his perpetuation into British politics after 1940, at the expense of the British Empire and everything else. Churchill and his policy is consistent if you look at it as the perpetuation of Churchillianism. In the same way that Napoleon, despite being a complete failure towards the end of his career, was wanting to be master of his own legacy for posterity. I believe that's what Churchill ultimately designed in terms of his, not only a creation of a national history through his history of English speaking peoples, but in terms of his rhetoric, in terms of his mastery of the English language, but in terms of his political outlook and his preservation of the British empire, everything he did destroyed that. But like Lloyd George before him, he continued a policy of total war against Germany, based on his, as I've said, his ideological preconception and his backing, but ultimately because it sustained him in power. And any deviation from that policy would have resulted in him being removed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can only say if you if you look at his stated aims versus his actual outcomes, he is a contender for one of the worst politicians of all time, or one of, or one of the worst leaders of all time, because he's just, I mean, his... He, you know, he continuously paints himself as a defender of the British Empire, but is ultimately the man most responsible for giving away the empire, which is just, you know. Um, and, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, see, uh, I see Churchill chiefly as an agent of foreign interests, to put it frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I mean... I, I guess to to try to wrap up the uh, the theme of the stream here, the only rationale I can come up with really for the traitorous behaviour of many of these elites, Churchill, chief among them, is because ultimately they were working for another interest. I, mean, I can't really, I, can, I cannot really come up with any other any other explanation for their actions. Um, I sometimes wonder the same thing, by the way, about America's current le leadership, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, you can, you can fill in which interests those are. Um, but also, when it comes to Churchill himself, I often wonder if he was, 
it's not only those interests that you're all thinking of, but maybe also American interests. Because if you look at the actions of the British elites and the interests of the burgeoning American empire, it's like the the part, well, what we call the, uh, the empire today, um, the American empire. I mean, I don't know if any empire in history has ever come about with such a smooth transition from the previous one. Um, and there are contexts that people forget, like in the, in the aftermath of World War II, um, there were some people who thought, well, there's now going to have to, at some point, be a war between Britain and America for global supremacy, right? Because it's like, well, one of the, you know, America was growing in power. You know, maybe we'll see a, a dust up between the British and the Americans now. Obviously, that didn't. Obviously, you know that didn't happen. You know? <laughs> do you know what's quite an interesting comparison here? In terms of, it's very obvious that, as even with the Atlantic Declaration, even before Pearl Harbor, FDR and his administration have resolved that they are getting into the war and they are going to focus on Europe first. It is simply a matter of finding a convenient pretext, which ultimately was facilitated a few months down the line. But in terms of trying to find a weird parallel to this, I almost think of the Spanish War, the Peninsular War. Napoleon essentially entered Spain with the pretext of attacking Portugal, which was in turn supporting Britain. When he was there, he staffed all the major fortresses and all the major cities with French garrisons. Then at a later point, he summoned the king and his heir to Bayonne in France and simply said, I'm getting rid of you and I'm replacing you with my brother Joseph. At the time, there was a very smooth transition of power and essentially just a French regime being placed in what was essentially the Spanish regime before. And this heralds the end of the Spanish empire, coincidentally, the end of the Spanish empire in the Americas with the exception of Cuba and the Philippines. The exception here, however, is that the Spanish would eventually fight back, hence the Peninsula War. In the case of Britain, there was no fighting. There was a complete acceptance. And this is because the process of occupation was facilitated by the British elites. There was no need of FDR to bring Churchill to the White House and say, I'm deposing you because you're contrary to my aims. Churchill was completely willing to go ahead. And I, again, I I push back against this idea that he was solely working for foreign interests. It very much his legacy compounds that idea, especially if you look at his reputation in America and the fact that he was awarded honorary citizenship of the United States and the fact that he's so enamored with this idea of perpetuating the fraternity of the English speaking peoples. But to me, it is the perpetuation of legacy and it is the perpetuation of this man in power driven by a policy which is supportive of his own political career but is detrimental to the cause he ultimately supports i mean you you get extraordinary things though. like in this book britain's empires okay this is a this is on pay if anybody if anybody forks out the 120 pounds i paid to buy this book it's on page 325 okay all right this is this is uh this is in 1940 41 42 sort of time so in the in the middle of world war ii some in the u.s administration wanted to go further the alliance between America and Britain was explained in a manifesto called the Atlantic Charter um, in August of 1941. The Charter pro promised the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they live. Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells, in a speech in 1941, said that, quote, our victory must bring in its train the liberation of all peoples and the age of imperialism is ended. Winston Churchill reacted ang angrily to this and other noises coming from the American administration. He wrote in the Times on the 11th of November, 1942, Churchill, quote, Let me make this clear. In case there should be any mistake about it in any quarter, I mean to hold our own. I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. <laughs> and I think that is, that really should be on his grave. But, you know, that should be on his grave, that quote. So, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, it's wonderful. And of course, he'd already 
he'd already fucked us over by supporting the basis for destroyers, which is, that's the basis for American military bases today. It was basically handed over by the British Empire for these obsolete American destroyers. It's, it really is rather remarkable. But what you see in the American Declaration, which is very clear from American policymakers, it was designed as much against the British Empire, against Germany. And of course, it wasn't really designed against the Soviet Union. Another point we, we need to mention in terms of the expectation that US aid to the, United, uh, to the United Kingdom needs to be paid back, either by territorial concessions or by essentially indebting the UK economy to the US for the next 100 years. With the Soviet Union, relatively, they are granted carte blanche. The US is essentially responsible for elevating the Soviet empire while dooming the British empire. And the reason I think this happens and why you look at the process of self-determination in the Atlantic Declaration is that FDR's administration, of course, was completely infiltrated by leftists. The, the Communist Party, say, for example, in the United States, when the Soviet Union recognized was recognized by the United States in 1933, very shortly after FDR came to power, um, there were 80,000 official Communist Party members and, of course, various communist sympathizing advisors and New York Times agents, the journalistic sort of press towards the Soviet Union, uh, underplaying the effects of the Holdemore and the purges, despite the fact that this was causing major rifts within the socialist and communist movement throughout the world. The Soviet Union received almost carte blanche from the Roosevelt administration. Um, my view, in addition to everything else, is that these are fellow leftists, the FDR administration, New Dealism, and mm -hmm. communism bringing to an end the process of colonialism. If anything, from FDR's point of view, this is the culmination of the idea of the propositional nation, that the United States was formed in reaction to the purported tyranny of George III and the overweening authorities of a foreign power to impose a settlement, in this case a tax settlement, against the United States. If anything, 1945 onwards represents the ideological culmination, why the United States should be seen constantly as an existential threat, in addition to the British facilitating their own doom, semi agog and the fact that British empire and the interests of a British elite are not one and the same as indicative of this idea of a central fugal process. And nothing contrasts this better than looking at the anarchy and betrayal of the British quote-unquote administration when one compares it to Stalin. Stalin was an imperial figurehead. Stalin had an imperial foreign policy. And the great betrayal of FDR's legacy here is that Stalin did not want to become ingratiated into the new United Nations that he and his wife were setting up. Instead, Stalin wanted to retain an imperial policy, buffer states in, the, in, um, buffer states in Eastern Europe, uh, expanded policy in China, influences in Iran, influences in Manchuria, basically returning back to the old Tsarist policies, albeit with um, a communist gloss to it. To my mind, the victory of Stalin versus the nadir of the British Empire is the fact that Stalin was able to economically consolidate his bloc into Comic-Con, which was separate from the US economic system to a degree, whereas Britain utterly failed in its attempt to form that similar process of economic imperial integration by imperial preference. The only time it was brought up as a serious option was per the imperial conferences of 1932, in which it was basically seen as a last ditch effort to shore up the economy as a result of the Great Depression. It was not seen as a major ideological bulwark. And of course, even during the war, the imperial conferences are transitioning into the Commonwealth conferences. There is already an admission that the British Empire is coming to an end, even as they are fighting the war. And in terms of the culmination of statism, we have the Beveridge Report, which again is actually the implementation of which begins under the Conservative government. You can almost say that Labour is running social policy under essentially a, a Tory branch, which is represented by Churchill as the spiritual figurehead of this movement. There's no, there's nothing that really convinces me that Churchill could not have led a Labour government with aptly retaining his position as Deputy Prime Minister or Lord Privy Seal, etc., or position he had, which is all the more remarkable and compounds this idea of why the Conservatives will want to normalise the legacy of Labour in the 1950s and 60s, and why they would follow in the policy of imperial disintegration, especially post-Suez, which is simply a confirmation of the fact that Churchill has acted as the midwife for the remnants of an institutional British empire to the American empire, and that 
he himself has ultimately divested the British Empire of any authority and whatever powers have been responsible for leading that transition have now successfully taken one host and now they have moved to another and it really is incredible and you brought up AA this idea of when has there been a case of a smooth transition of power and purported treason I brought up the Spanish example but also think of the Soviet Union from 1986 in yeah, terms of in terms of in, ter- in terms of Gorbachev, I mean, I believe Gorbachev was a traitor. I believe Gorbachev was driven by the same sentiments of Churchill, careerism, reform, combined with essentially total acquiescence to the loss of the Soviet Empire. Whilst Gorbachev was advocating for Russian Soviet withdrawal from East Germany, which was essentially nothing more than a Soviet base in Europe, um, Honecker the head of the Socialist Union Party was wanting to take his cue from Tiananmen Square in China and crush the revolt. Gorbachev overruled him. All the communist governments essentially disintegrate. Ceausescu is killed. The leader of the Bulgarian Communist Party is beheaded. And within the Soviet Union itself, the constitutional situation per Perestroika and Glasnost had been established to allow for the complete disintegration of Soviet communism and the elimination of the Soviet Union himself to the point that Gorbachev's position becomes redundant. That to me, and again, who benefits from that? NATO, the American empire. It seems the American empire and the forces attached to it, which aren't synonymous with the interests of the American empire, are exemplars in terms of being able to facilitate this transition of power. And what is remarkable in terms of what we're seeing today, relating this to the history of today and current events, is that it is clear the Americans have lost that capacity. Oh, I, I, absolutely. Uh, there is one small note. I know we want to finish the stream AM, but there's one small note I want to make on the Malayan emergency that you mentioned as a bit of an outlier. Like, why did the British fight that one as opposed to all the others? And I would say that that particular conflict has to be seen, speaking of the of the, of the communists, you know, has to be seen in the context of the, of the Cold War. And you'll notice in that one, they had American help. They had, uh, that one had kind of American blessing to fight. And the actual outcome of the Malayan emergency was the formation of what became Malaysia today. So they still got independence, just not just not communist one. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like... It, well, well, again, it, a, there's a contradiction it, here because it, whilst the Americans, you're right, were supporting Malaya and ultimately Malaya and Singapore would separate, what were the Americans doing with the Dutch East Indies? They betrayed the Dutch and a UN resolution said, no, you're not going to be able to go back and reclaim your colony. Indonesia is now independent. And what happens to Indonesia? A pro-communist government comes in until it's destroyed by an American color color revolution in the 1960s. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. But uh, I just wanted wanted to comment there that I do not think that the British fought that one to hold on to a ter- uh, an imperial territory. They just didn't want to lose it to the commies. No, I, 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 I think I.e. was fair. kind of like, yeah. i.e. we'd already moved into American-led Cold War politics by that point. And you can, I, I, I need to bring this up because I've done the stream on it last week, uh, which is talking about the situation in South Vietnam. It seems that French policy and British policies, re the Far East, were almost completely aligned in terms of holding on to the empire as an extension of Cold War politics. Um, But of course, in both cases, you can say the Malayan example is a success, but the Vietnamese example was an unmitigated disaster. But as we see the end of the British Empire in the 1950s, the French Empire goes down with the British, albeit, funny enough, as with Vietnam and Algeria, the French actually put up a little bit more of a fight than the British do. Semiagog, I'm very conscious of the fact that you have been very patiently listening to me wittering on, and I I thank you for that patience. Um, But now we've sort of reached the end of the stream before we get into Super Chats, because I'm conscious this has been over three hours. I really want to get your sort of full spectrum perspective, uh, your full spectrum perspective, given all of the points you've raised about the nature of the powers that be facilitating the uh, end of the British Empire. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. And no problem with uh, with uh, me being patient. I forced both of you to listen to my extensive um, 
droning. So yeah, uh, and all interesting uh, points that I've been listening to since. Um, I, th I think it's important to underscore that uh, the United States hasn't been a winner in this either. Um, our debt is spiraling out of control. Our nation has been absolutely wrecked. Um, and so it, those powers, in my view, uh, Anglo-American powers sitting on top of both um, that basically gutted Britain as they moved over uh, to the United States. Um, I believe they, uh, it should be understood that, you know, as I was trying to say early at the outset of the stream, you know, that the, the it isn't America, quote unquote, that has won as a result of this, though I would imagine from, you know, 1950 to 1990, you know, there was a sweet run there. But Britain has had its sweet runs, too, um, and has since been gutted. Likewise, we have since been gutted and we have been footing the bill uh, across the world for this preposterous uh, obscenity of being the world's policeman and imposing our bullshit on other other country. So I wanted to point that out. The other thing that I think is worth understanding is a, a kind of a wrap up of this idea, which does fit with what I just said, which is that it's an Anglo-American elite that is perfectly happy to, to clean its boots on the people of uh, both countries. Um, this Anglo-American elite persists. It, um, it now has since uh, World War One, at least um, a heavy, heavy uh, Jewish financial admixture. Um, and it's also had its game uh, complicated by having to deal with the rise of uh, the Soviet Union and then later the Chinese, who I don't think have gotten the credit they deserve for their cunning uh, in, in their own intelligence work and financial subversion. Um, but the, uh, the th these powers um, persist to this day. And, and looking at Churchill's face here, um, it, it, it occurs to me that, you know, with both FDR and with Churchill, they both came from Navy backgrounds, among other backgrounds, and both were heavily, heavily backed uh, by Jews. And it and, and and we see today, you know, that, that little bit I read from Quigley about managerialism, you know, it was interesting that you mentioned uh, the, the uh, Atlantic Declaration, because that's really what set the stage for uh, the five eyes. You know, there's always lots of talk about bringing Japan in as another eye, right? But the five eyes, the five eyes are basically um, this Milnerian, Rhodesian idea mm. of control of all the English speaking world through uh, a centralized network of managers, basically, government by intelligence services. Um, who, who they manage the the, the so-called democratic exercises. They they intercede with color revolutions where necessary. They bring people down uh, as necessary, as we just saw with the heavy heavy British intelligence service involvement involvement with the so-called you know Russia um, or, or what's called the Russia hoax against Trump. Um, the Five Eyes, which really start with Bletchley Park. Um, you know, we get the Brits coming over and helping us set up our intelligence services. They closely cooperate with New Zealand and Australia. Um, that's truly our government today. The Five Eyes intelligence services in some sense. And, you know, uh, FDR with his Navy background, Churchill with his Navy background, the one of them an Anglo-Dutch American, the other one an Anglo-American. They bring us a power structure exercise through what's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And now they want to bring Japan not only possibly into Five Eyes, but into NATO too. It's, it's the same basic structure of world domination, incontestably. It's just now funded by U.S. taxpayers, and it's still naval power based. I mean, everybody should be reading Mahan or Mahan or however you say his name, the great theorist of, uh, of, of naval warfare. So uh, in summary, I would say that I, I continue, despite uh, and in and, and large part because of what I've heard um, this evening and talking to both of you who and both of you know much more about many of the aspects of this than I, I had to cram last minute because I, I know fuck all about um, 19th, 20th century history, but I'm confirmed in my belief that 
it's a set of elites and they're Anglo-American and they have been for, uh, you know, they've been pretty much running the show since the 1850s, 1870s, at least. And they don't care about countries. They're deterritorialized, they're deracinated, and they, they're pumping what continues to be an ever more senile um, utopian program of, of, you know, egalitarianism and human fungibility and ideas of, you know, socialism and all the rest. I think it's, um, I think it's worth meditating on the fact that it's not Britain versus America or America versus Britain as both countries or the one country and the other empire or both empires have manifestly been screwed by the, by the backroom um, you know, gentlemen's club and Masonic lodge or whatever the hell these organizations are. We've, we've both respective peoples have been fucked by them. Um, so I hope that in future we can, we can, um, see what we have in common, uh, and, and what differs between us. And I, I certainly don't mean to in any sense, um, reduce American culpability for our current state of affairs, at least in so far as we, the people of the United States have allowed this shit to continue, um, operating for the most part in sort of ignorance of it or being perfectly happy to, um, you know, be willfully blind to it. But I hope in future that we, uh, we can step around this idea that there's a uniquely American thing going on here. Um, and that there's a unique American culpability. Again, not to reduce um, the, the the facts of the, the, that we are the, the the nastiest component of it, and at present are pushing it um, hard. Yeah, it's a uh, it's one group, I believe, or factions that that have one leg in uh, New York and the other leg in New York City, and the other leg in uh, in City of London. Well, well, thank you for that semiagog, and before I go to AA and ask for his um, final uh, view on this, uh, his summary, I want to jump off from two of your points, which is to say that I do not believe that many of these things were necessarily inevitable. I do believe a fundamental part of history is immersing oneself in counterfactuals. Otherwise, you can leave. You can lead essentially down a teleological path where history can only exist as is. But of course, there are so many different policies emanating out in order to gain a broader perspective of the possibilities of certain individuals, organizations, institutions. It should be obvious as to why understanding of counterfactuals is necessary in order to contrast history with the possibilities and thereby the shortcomings and indeed the genius inherent in some motivations. But regarding this. And regarding what you brought up, I, I, of course, have been consistently of the view that the British Empire was many empires that never coalesced. Regarding the United States, I do not believe that the United States had to undergo a process of being a propositional nation, which is ultimately beholden to something which was contrary to US interests, the interests of ordinary Americans, let's put, let's put this um, clearly. Of course, this isn't a revolutionary thought. It's been expounded on many streams and uh, articles within the sphere, which is the idea of successive states or republics within the United States. The idea that the US Civil War was a conflict between two interpretations of the United States Constitution, one that emphasized state rights, and you can say had an ethnic conception of what it meant to be American, more focusing on the Anglopho, uh, the the English sort of cavalier spirit, and the North, which was focusing more on the integration of unionism to transform the United States into something which was fundamentally different. At the same time that the US was consolidating into this new republic post the Lincoln presidency, the British Empire is undergoing a separate process. It is beginning to award concessions to say, for example, in Canada, it'll do the same in South Africa, it'll do the same in Australia, New Zealand, and ultimately in the Brit and ultimately in British India. So already in the 1860s, you're seeing a process to allow this transition between states to occur. And indeed, this is a reciprocal process, as you mentioned, which is both sides have culpability in this. 
But this is to say that the American Republic, as it existed before the US Civil War, I do not believe was an existential threat, but it became so in terms of a period of breach and a period of transition. But you also mentioned, Semyagog, that we have underestimated China in the stream. And to point out in terms of this is a history of betrayal and a history of being trumped by other more effective powers, who ultimately gave away the last possession of the British Empire? In 1997, Hong Kong was handed over to China in a very preferential treatment to the Chinese, which I believe was not inevitable. Hong Kong Island itself was ceded to Great Britain in perpetuity. It was instead the new territories that had a lease with China, and that itself was open to negotiation. Instead, it was not an obligation for the British to hand over Hong Kong. It was instead Deng Xiaoping, the then premier of China, or paramount leader or whatever, essentially giving Thatcher an ultimatum and that Thatcher acquiesces. Any sort of notion of the protection of two systems, one country or whatever, is now completely out of the window. And now China is attempting to redefine that regarding its relationship with Taiwan. So the history of betrayal and this idea of passive transition from empire to the augmentation of its enemies is not just consistent in America, but it's consistent in China as well. The final outpost of the British Empire being ceded to what is now ultimately a hostile foreign great power. But that's all I have to say. Um, AA, uh, what are your thoughts regarding this in summary? Um, well, I mean, I would say the only real areas of, or, or I'd say the main speed that I still have lingering with, with, with Semiagog's analysis is that I would prefer to disaggregate the the money men. Um, I think that there's a good argument to say that the Carnegies and Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and all these sorts of characters, um, I actually have a much rosier view of them than, than Semyagog uh, uh, seems to. Um, you know, I, I think there was a book written about those guys called The Men Who Built America. Um, and... You know, along with other great tycoons like Henry Ford and so on, I, I have a much rosier view of them. You know, uh, I, I actually think that was America when it was be at its at its best. It was kind of you know it was producing great men who were doing amazing things. Um, now, speaking of Henry Ford, he did have a newspaper at one point, and he actually addressed this. He addressed this exact issue head on. He talks about the differences between. And I, and I believe J.P. Morgan was his his chief kind of. I, I, I'm pretty sure Ford banked with with, with Morgan himself, um, and he actually talks at length about the difference between um, uh, Jewish financiers and non-Jewish ones. Uh, it, it's a it's a chapter called "The Jew versus Non-Jew in New York Finance," where and he names names and he goes through them all. And um, but he he basically suggests. That the chief difference, he says, non-Jewish bankers usually feel obligated to retain a connection with the enterprises they have financed in order to assure the investors a proper administration of funds. They feel obliged to contribute to the success of the investments which they handle for other people. The Jewish banker, in contrast, keeps his liquid capital. The cash is always in his coffers. This is essential to his position as one who deals in money. Um, and he he basically stresses the fact that they're chiefly making their money with quick turnovers and loans uh, versus the investment the investment side of it. If that makes any sense, where you, you essentially invest in a company and then you have a vested interest in how well that company does. Yeah, it's, um, uh, slash and burn agriculture versus you know really trying to cultivate the soil. And and I would just say that I I mean I don't have. You know, I think everybody would need to do further research on it. But my, I really get a sense that there was a hidden, um, a hidden tussle, a rivalry between two different sets of elites that were going on at that time. And if you really, I mean, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but if you go down it, you'll see that the one set of money men backed one side and another set of money men back to different side um and i think it's always worth in our analysis uh reminding ourselves of uh you know various ethnic interests um 
and I believe, I mean, my own belief is that what happened within America is that uh, there was a decisive victory for one side. You can work out which side it was <laughs> in your own time if you would like. But uh, that's, the, I mean, that's that's my own. I, I, I guess that that's where I have an issue with the with with the kind of um, Quigley Sutton stuff. Is that it? It's just like, well, I mean, you know, I mean, you talked about FDR earlier on AM. That that chap Bernard Baruch, who I mentioned, is basically one of the architects of the New Deal. Mm. You know, you know, understand what I'm saying? Right? Anyway. That's, that's something for a that's some kind of food for further thought well there's like, one last yeah. point really to actually jump off from you as i jumped off from semagogue's point aa which is regarding the elites as ostensibly being fundamentally malicious it's actually coming back to the idea of cecil rhodes yes cecil rhodes has you, you can say a mixed legacy i think that's incontrovertible but he also turned what was essentially a African backwater, what is now Zimbabwe, into the breadbasket of Africa. In many ways, it became a African white settler success story. Indeed, I have family connections dating back to Rhodesia, so I have a personal connection there. Having essentially been a success story within Africa of the British Empire regard, regarding emigration and regarding the integration of essentially of an imperial elite overseas, the British Empire then did everything in its power to destroy the creation they made, the legacy of Cecil Rhodes. Ian Smith, in 1965, as Britain was pursuing its policy of imperial disintegration, offered the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, um, the crown of Rhodesia to retain its membership within the Commonwealth. But as we know, as per policy from the 1960s and 70s, the charter of the Commonwealth had become egalitarian self-determination, basically a repetition of the American Declaration, if not going one step further. So any link with the legacy of the empire in Africa, and again, this is contrasted with Boer nationalism, Africana nationalism in South Africa, which was hostile to the British Empire, Rhodesia was unique compared to South Africa in that it wanted to remain part of the Anglosphere, wanted to retain this connection. It was betrayed. The British then refused to ratify a compromise agreement in 1979, I believe, whereby the Archbishop of, what was it, Salisbury, uh, became president. Instead, they wanted Mugabe and ZANU-PF to take over power. And that itself led to the process of black majority rule. And then, of course, agricultural confiscate, uh, confiscation, turning one of the success stories into Africa into a complete disaster. And that's really beyond any doubt here. So the British Empire being a fundamental contradiction, destroying its allies and eliminating its own legacy can only be attributed to the fact that the British Empire was, if not run directly by, then definitely influenced by people who were outright treasonous. That, that's where I'm going to leave it before I get onto the super chats. And I really want to thank both of you for all of your points here. I've learned a lot from the stream and I really do thank you for that. Judge Caligula Bushman for two euros just sends a coffee. Thank you very much. Brent Taylor for five US dollars. Does serfdom, as opposed, as opposed to wage slavery, inculcate a cyclical view of history? And do the commemorative plates, flags, etc., reify the empire? I think regarding point one, uh, as the we have the author of the Prophets of Doom here, do you think serfdom inculcates a cyclical view of history? I mean, what I would say is that each of the each of the four castes, um, you know, in the cyclical view, degenerate. So, so the the warrior caste uh, go from an honor based system and degenerate into mere mercenaries, uh, and eventually, in their lower state, uh, and this is not meant as any offense to any military men watching this, but in their final state, just basically kind of like paid employees of the state. Right, the kind of standing national army, um, as opposed to knights who had, you know, pledges of honors and oaths and so on, and um, so it is with the, so it is with the peasantry. They they also suffer devolutions uh, in the cyclical view. So it's a kind of degeneration. The, the, the serf who has uh, 
um, you know, uh, social bonds and uh, kind of genuine love for his liege um, versus the uh, typical relationship between, you know, a uh, a wage a wage laborer today. Um, and, you know, it's probably controversial in the modern age, but um, there is a lot to suggest that many people would be happier as the serf uh, than as the wage laborer. Um, I know Americans are very wedded to the idea of liberty and so on. Um, so this is kind of anathema to some people listening, I, I imagine. Um, and, and also in this country, uh, you know, this, this idea that uh, it's actually like free, you know, you're free to be a wage laborer. Um, but uh, there's a lot of uh, research to suggest that it's anxiety inducing, uh, makes people unhappy. You can look at the female experience since they became wage laborers. It's called the female happiness paradox. You're all familiar with it. Um, and in fact, recently, uh, you know, in preparation for my next book, I've been reading Eric Fromm, who is a psychologist who associated with the Frankfurt School, believe it or not, um, who uh, did a lot of work on this and, and, and actually suggested that many people would be happier with serfs. So there, there you go. No, thank you very much for that, AA. And as for the second point, do commemorative plates, flags, etc., reify the empire? No, I believe that these are simply trappings, almost like the makeup on a corpse, um, done by a, uh, <laughs> uh, done during uh, just before a funeral. I, it, it should be noted that when you see imperial kitsch. Uh, during the Edwardian period, when you see celebrations of things like Empire Day, they basically preceded the empire's existence by a couple of decades. In the same way, unfortunately, I see the monarchy now. It's nothing more than kitsch. It's simply ornamentation and idolatry, effectively, augmenting a system of power which is contrary to every genuine notion of sacred monarchy unfortunately, and I do believe that's the case with the veneration of the British Empire. And as I believe it, the fundamental end of the British Empire is not Suez, it is not the loss of African colonies, it is not even the loss of Hong Kong in 1997, um, but it's the transition between subject, fidelity to the monarchy and citizen, which is an American Republican importation. Uh, D's bit of rough for two pounds. Um, amazing stream, gents. Uh, thank you all. Well, that's very much appreciated. Um, Jacob for five dollars. Great stream. Thanks, AM. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, Melon for two dollars. Nothing to add. Thanks for the stream. Well, thank you very much, Melon. And uh, 99 Iron Duke echoes their sentiments with two dollars. Great stream, AM. Thank you very much. Um, Lady of Shalott for five dollars uh could things have been different had the british monarchy been assertive and made a stand to save the empire or was it overwhelmingly inevitable i don't think it's inevitable i don't think history unless i'm basically following a catholic mode of everything a series of decline a series of failures leading up to the end of the world and the apocalypse um in terms of viewing this from a completely humanistic point of view and looking at this in terms of the context of a series of counterfactuals i don't believe it's inevitable but whenever the monarchy tried to assert itself it tended to end badly so for example charles the first and his deposition and regicide, I do believe is indicative of the succession of revolutions, which is going to result essentially in the subversion and end of the British Empire. And as I've been emphasizing, and I believe Semyagor compounds this point, the centrifugalism of interest to which there is no self-interested body representing the British Empire. And that is a consequence of the failure of monarchy. I don't mean literally in the sense of a king, but I mean in terms of a figurehead, a, a Caesar, effectively, in Spenglerian terms. Whenever the British monarchy did assert itself, so for example, with Charles II, who tried to implement reforms in the New World, these were reversed when we had the Dutch revolt, Dutch coup. And in 1776, there was an attempt to make the colonies profitable for the British Empire after the war of uh, the Seven Years' War, which won Canada for the British Empire and won most of India. Um, and of course, that ended disastrously. The only time there has been an effective British monarch who was able to conduct an effective imperial policy was Oliver Cromwell. 
And of course, I believe him almost to be a complete aberration in the history of Great Britain. Um, so, like I said, it's conflicted. If you look at Whig historians who become high Tory historians, the emphasis on institutions, the emphasis is on the retention of crown in parliament, the melding of all these institutions together. You can say that that is the philosophy, and again with the Church of England, that is the philosophy underpinning 1688. By 1829, that philosophy was essentially dead, as far as I'm concerned. And that was just the beginning of the process of the expansion of the British Empire. So I don't believe there is really any overlap between these authorities. Indeed, as we see the expansion of Britain as possessing many dominions and many powers, so comes with it a fundamental lapse in central authority. And I would place Lord Salisbury as really the only sort of the imperial hegemon within the British Empire. I think really he's the last one, and he was also one of the last competent prime ministers we've ever had. Uh, Double Dime for $5. Thank you for the stream. Thank you very much. Johannes de Salentio for eight Australian dollars. Thank you very much. Great show. Thank you all. Can Australia and New Zealand drift away from Britain? Uh, be better blamed on Irish unionism, falling, uh, failing imperial federation or Singapore? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I've, I've talked about Australia and New Zealand, especially regarding the Australian constitutional crisis. Um, I, I do believe that Irish unionism failing and the creation of an Irish Republic was incredibly dramatic in terms of the loss of confidence in the British Empire. It's the unsung story of appeasement. And I don't really understand why we just ignore the fact that 1922 was not the end of British influence in Ireland. It was in the 1930s. Eamon de Valera came to power at the same time that Hitler came to power. And ultimately, his legacy in terms of asserting Irish independence was far more effective and vehemently anti-British and pro-Catholic. It's only been in the last 10 or 20 years that Ireland has basically been ground zero for some horrific social experiment which has been imposed to make Ireland indicative of global homo, homo in extremists. Do you think that's a fair assessment? I mean, it, 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 one, one thing I wanted to say is that the question about inevitability earlier on, because I was thinking about it in terms of cyclical history, and it is almost mystical, the loss of will that occurs, right? Because at each step, at each step of the way, there's a counterfactual where they chose differently. But clearly, for some, for one reason or another, the will was not there. And the and the power and the parallels in some way with some of the American elites today. I mean, I, sometimes I look at the actions of Joe Biden, who, in my opinion, is on if if his term, if he if Trump wins next time, I reckon Biden's on odds on to be like worst president ever type thing. Um, but his actions are so harmful and so sabotaging and traitorous that I wonder if this just if there is some like weird thing like your time is up. This is it. You've got like it, it's uh you know I was also thinking about like the late USSR. There's this kind of weird moment where an elite, an elite just kind of gives up. You know, uh, you could probably pick up your own examples, but it, it is straight. It is a strange thing, isn't it? Um, and I do think you're right, uh, AM, that the Irish situation is the, is the beginning of it. Um, and in fact, in this book, Britain's uh, Empires, it's really interesting because he starts the book with Ireland as the first colony. And in some ways, it's the it's the first one to leave as well, not counting the America, America obviously. Um, you know, it's, it's, he puts it as the first colony and then wh when that leaves, it's the beginning of the end, pretty much. No, and I, I agree with you because unionism and imperial federation and imperial consolidation go hand in hand. And this was an unequivocal failure of unionism and the failure of unionism continued. I mean, everyone sort of lords the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was a complete statement of defeat. It was an acknowledgement that essentially the Irish situation had changed, um, that the troubles had basically resulted in the, in the end of unionism, effectively. What unionism exists in Ireland is simply forced to wear a straitjacket alongside Sinn Féin. It's 
I mean, it's nothing. We're not going back to the era of Carlson. And I mean, in some senses, you're right, especially if we're looking at English colonialism, um, which begins, what, during the reign of Henry II in the 12th century. I think that's an, an interesting point to make. The way that Ireland was integrated into the United Kingdom was very much a process from without, as opposed to Scotland, uh, which joined, again, at another point we didn't really mention, Scotland, the creation of the, the Kingdom of Great Britain, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, was the result of Scotland wanting to join into the British maritime and commercial empire through the Darien scheme. That's fundamentally why. So you could almost say that the British Empire preceded the creation of Great Britain itself. Just a, a, a point to mention there. It, it, it's probably, I mean, this is a t uh, very small point, but I've always been fascinated with the extent to which uh, the Scots massively over index within the within the elite of the of the British Empire since their you know since the since joining the Union. Um everybody talks about various other questions, but the, I've always thought there's an S key as well. So many, so many elite Scots, but anyway. Well no, it's a shame that uh, I haven't had Columba on a stream for so long because then we maybe we get his perspective on this. Um but really um I I've obviously observe that and especially even in the the Labour Party during the uh, the Blair era but I, I don't have an answer for that unfortunately. Um, Lady of Shalott for five Australian dollars thank you very much. It's known that Churchill was often short of money although he was born in Blenheim Palace he was not born to the wealthy branch of the Marlboroughs. The Marlboroughs are interesting because I almost see the Marlboroughs as indicative of everything that I've been seeing from their very inception. The patron of the family in the 17th century was also Asa Winston Churchill. And one of his daughters became the mistress of one King James II. Another one of his children, a son, was one John Churchill, who put down the Monmouth Rebellion in 1685, which consolidated James II's reign. Who was one of the principal actors in betraying James II and going along with the Immortal Seven? none other than John Churchill, who was basically family and his entire career had been supported by James II. So let me say that the history of betrayal and the Churchill family is <laughs> extensive, um, so to speak. Um, but Churchill, I mean, his father, Randolph Churchill, I mean, Chur Winston Churchill himself was pretty obsessed with Randolph, who um, died prematurely of syphilis. Randolph was a pioneer, you can say, in the legacy of Chamberlain and Tory democracy and uh, the Primrose League in terms of representing a an aspect of one nation Toryism when it actually used to be aristocratic and paternalistic as opposed to now where it's just a it's just basically a skin suit for progressivism. There's nothing really more to it, especially when people like Theresa May use that terminology. Um, but he was descend he wasn't the son of the Duke, but he was descended from a lesser branch of the Marlboroughs. And in the way that his father was a very strange individual, you can say again, he's the successor of that legacy. Even though as Semiagog will be the first to point out that his conception is as a result of a very sort of common policy, again, talking about Anglo-American elite, which is bringing over wealthy American heiresses to marry into the British aristocracy. Yes, and one's very often from uh, New, New England, although there have been uh, a fair number, I think, of uh, uh, daughters of uh, holders of massive pig slaughterhouse holdings in Illinois as well yeah um uh, churchill's uh, mother was uh, was from new york if i remember correctly uh i'm not going to read your name but uh thank you for the super chat mighty b you know who you are uh two australian dollars the last white man to be named winston unfortunately i don't believe that's the case <laughs> um chris o'hanlon for five pounds jp morgan was booked onto the titanic and cancelled at the last minute uh, what are we to make of this? Well, Semigog will be the expert on this. Uh, uh, no, I, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing I can observe there. Uh, Phantom Spaceman for JP Morgan did the Titanic. You hear it here first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. 
Oh, we've also been talking about the Lusitania, so it'll be very consistent, wouldn't it? Um, Phantom Spaceman for five dollars. Can't wait to go back and listen to this whole stream with an all-star lineup. Love this crew, and yes, we've been very fortunate with the lineup for this evening. Uh, Castro Valva for five pounds. Hello, gents. Do you think Britain, England, had a chance of has a chance of resurgence in the future? If not, do you think what do you think will be the Britain's role in the twenty-first century? Well, if you want my personal view. Uh, Castro Valva regarding the prospects of England. I had basically become a full Togogawa shogunate apologist. I want complete isolationism. I've, I've had enough. I want, I, I want a autarkic little England, that effectively sort of maintaining visual around the islands. That's it. That's obviously not going to happen unless there is a dramatic social collapse over the next century, which given how everything is going at the moment, is very possible. I mean, in terms of the transition of elites, Britain has been conquered by the legacy of the British Empire in terms of a complete reversal of personnel. And obviously that's encapsulated in the person of our prime minister. I, I mentioned in a tweet a while ago that because he has no mandate, because he wasn't elected, he wasn't even elected by the party. In fact, he had explicitly lost the election to Liz Truss and everyone seems to forget that Liz Truss was prime minister. But his only mandate officially in terms of our constitution comes from King Charles. And it, the thought occurred to me that the grandson of the last emperor of India is responsible for appointing the first Indian viceroy <laughs> for Great Britain. Um, I don't have a, a positive prospect of Britain going, considering everything that's happened, but AA I'm sure has a lot more to say on this. Just buggered to be honest. I mean, I, I, uh, I, uh, Toynbee talks about the need for a nation to have a period of with, with withdrawal so that it can come, come back again, which is essentially what AM is uh, talking about. But increasingly, I believe that the withdrawal may even be smaller, i.e. Uh, the withdrawal of the, of the kind of uh, the British diaspora, if you want, within to itself even as an ethnic enclave um with a uh, you know within a within a nation that's being overrun by foreigners uh, essentially so i am very much of the mind that uh, basically everything's hopeless and like morgoth says go and go and uh, start an allotment or something I, I honestly i just see no i from the british point of view i see basically no good prospects at all at the moment um I, I don't want to be a bearer of like black pills, but um, in a way, if you write off hope uh, in that in that in a political sense, you can kind of get on with uh, having your, you know, surviving in it yourself, you know, if it ought to be becoming the man among the ruins, as Evla says. So. Well, well, given the overpopulation and what issues we're going to face regarding that, um, I mean, it almost sort of resembles. A policy like South Africa during the apartheid, albeit the other way around, <laughs> um, where we are going to have to allot ourselves in our own respective Bantu stans or Iranias or whatever, and see if there can be some sort of vestige of our nation retained there. Almost like a kind of Native American reservation. reservation. Yes. But where you do like, you get to do like white people stuff, right? Only like white people stuff is like building like amazing Cleaning things. Cleaning up there. trash. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, much like in South Africa where you see it there. So, yeah. Uh, the, the Enri for five pounds just says, thank you, AM and guests. And that is the end of the Super Chats. And it's been over four hours. So uh, I thank everyone for their uh, <laughs> persistence. And oh, no, sorry. One last Super Chat has just come over. Uh, is it possible to be independent with a weak Navy? Well, the course of the British history has actually proven that again and again to be rather fallacious. I mean, obviously, we didn't have a navy in 1066 when we were conquered by the Normans. We had a very, we had a navy that was of questionable effectiveness vis a vis the Dutch in the late 17th century. Um, and James II was incredibly unlucky. Um, and that helps explain why the Dutch coup was so successful in 1688. Um, indeed, you can say one of the reasons why. Charles I and his regime fell was his appropriation of ship tax, yet Britain, England had a very weak effective control of the Navy. Um, and of course, 
given our comparative weakness to the United States, I mean, we're nothing more than essentially a US base deposit, a, a missile silo. Um, An like unsinkable I, aircraft carrier off the coast of Europe. <laughs> Uh, which also means that we are far more of an easy target if uh, World War Three were to break out. But uh, it's best not to think about that. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Before we go, um, Semi Agog, of course, is my wonderful co-host in the series where we uh, we invert the uh, the usual sort of chronological uh, standard for historical exploration. Is there anything you would like to shill before we leave? Oh, just check out my uh, channel. You can find link there, links there for my uh, books. And I want to uh, certainly uh, thank you, uh, AM, for uh, putting this on uh, and for uh, tolerating my uh, gap-filled historical ramblings. But also, I want to say thank you very much to uh, AA for coming on and, uh, and, and having this discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you both. I think there's some consolation in thinking that this has been very comprehensive. I mean, obviously, we can't go over the details because we would be here for years. Um, but I think in terms of a, a summary, um, all of you have done very, very well. And I very much appreciate, it, uh, appreciate that. Um, AA, is there anything you would like to shill before we go? AA? Have we lost AA? Or possibly a parenthood emergency. Oh, oh, oh sorry, I was mute. I, uh, pick up Prophets of Doom, buy a course at the Academic Agency, join my channel, like and subscribe. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night.